Uh, good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. This is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee. Um, I uh, assisted with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to be recognized to speak. Um, okay, I ask that you all join me in this looking up. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. Uh, uh, say the Commission for Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, lifelong learners. Um, the next item of business is oral communication. And if anybody attending that wants to speak to the committee. Now is the time. Um, and rules for oral communication are um, the public shall have the opportunity at every school committee meeting to be heard under oral communications. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to the school committee business to appear before the school committee, state their problem without debate, and the matter may be referred to the proper subcommittee. For items that are on the agenda, members of the public may address the committee with the permission of the chair. Persons speaking under oral communication shall be limited to three minutes each and shall submit a copy of their prepared communication to the recording secretary. The school committee chair shall not allow complaints as to individual performance or character. Um, so do we have anybody who would like to speak? Seeing none, we will move on to uh, recognitions. And um, I think I'll start because um, our hockey team made it to the state semifinals for the first time in a long time. Um, I think the whole community was behind them in one way or another, whether they liked hockey or not. And I think it brought this tremendous excitement and buzz. Um, the team was really fun to watch. They, I think, impressed everybody across the state. Um, I think Coach Geary's best quote that I saw the day after, uh, the, day after the quarterfinal was that you know, Jack Costanza was the best hockey player in the state tonight. And I just thought it kind of captured just the talent that was on the on the ice in terms of all the kids. So, bravo. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Um, family Science Night at West Parish. Uh, took my kids on, on Friday. Um, my little five-year-old ensured my, my eight-year-old that we weren't going there to learn anything, but uh, maybe we did a little bit. They still, you know, like going back to school, but uh, yeah, they even they made some toys. Uh, they're still playing with them. So it was pretty cool. Uh, I think it was the support of the PTO. That was so special recognition for that. That's great. Oh, you did do it last week. Okay. Um, and I know we have, okay, so anybody else? No? Okay, the last thing I'll mention is um, I know there were five of our track team members who went to nationals. And Andrew Coelho is here for the Student Advisory Council. I see his name and I'm hoping he's gonna put on his camera. Hopefully. Yes? No. <laughs> I have no way to carry comes. There we go. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, good evening. We thought you would at least lead with your track news because you were one of the students and one of the athletes that, that competed. He's, he's driving. He's driving. He should not be driving. Oh. So we can do it later. I mean, it's up to you as a chair. Um, I'll be at my destination in like three minutes. So if you guys could just come back to me. <laughs> okay. Yep. You, you put your camera on when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Good choice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next order of business is the consent agenda. Does anybody have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, Maria, we'll call vote, please. 
Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Berta? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Leeson? Yes. Jefferson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minia? Yes. Um, great. So the next item business is deliberations on educational issues. Um, and I would hate to have Emily and Anna begin their report to only be interrupted. Yeah, I, I can do, we can do a couple of shorter things. That would be great. Start off, yeah, no problem. Um, great. So let's get the, back to the beginning or so. Um, I'll share over here. In terms of tonight's update, I don't want to share this. I'll let you slide show this. So again, our primary objective is to safely educate our students in our schools every day to maximize learning, address our students' full needs, and support community and family needs. Um, tonight, uh, we'll get a partnership update from the Gloucester Education Foundation moment in a little bit. A professional learning update um, from Greg Bach and Katie Bro. Uh, MCAS is beginning, so we'll just give you an update on the schedule for that. Uh, code update, and then um, the heart of the matter tonight is the uh, next step of the FY 2020 budget development, and that will be a review and approval of the public hearing budget. Um, so we'll just jump into, um, you were, uh, I handed out and also shared with you earlier tonight, the schedule of programs for the March 29th early release day, um, and Greg and Katie will um, help you, uh, help with just describe a little bit of, of the great work that is planned for all of our staff to do next week. Um, thank you. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. You can take a peek here, maybe just highlight a few of them. Um, and I would be remiss if we didn't highlight one of the big pieces, which is, uh, and Amy Kim couldn't be with us uh, tonight to talk about it, but uh, she's extremely excited about this uh, presentation. It's at the high school for the full GHS faculty, as well as district-wide uh, clinical staff. And, and it's the co-author of uh, Helping Traumatized Children to Learn and Creating and Advocating for Trauma-Sensitive Schools. Uh, Joel Restuccia um, will be presenting. Um, Principal Matt Fusco, Principal of the Veteran School, is going to be introducing uh, Joel. And um, uh, the, the book that Joel co-authored, uh, according to Amy, is uh, known in uh, the industry as the Purple Book and has been responsible for shaping many programs and, and careers, and, and in her opinion, uh, is the basis for the work at the Veterans School. Uh, a GHS student will also be speaking at the presentation um, to share her experiences and, and the kind of assistance she got. Um, and also Scott Allen and Ed Jacobs, who Spearheaded Handle with Care are going to be uh, in the presentation as well, and then training the entire police department that same day. Um, uh, they're going to give out 100 of the books, and I also want to mention that it's either co-sponsored or fully sponsored. I'm not sure, but it's quite significant uh, by the Gloucester Health Department. So we just want to, this is a, there have been a number of things at the Gloucester Health Department has um, partnered with us on uh, over the years. And uh, recently they've been uh, quite generous with helping uh, with financial support of a number of things. So just wanted to share those. Uh, so that's one of the big ones. Um, one of the other big pieces going on is we have the author of this book, the blue book, <laughs> uh, called The Knowledge Gap. Um, and uh, Natalie Wexler is the author. And this is a very big in educational circles uh, lately and really is an examination of the American educational system and the role of, um, of content knowledge, deep subject matter knowledge, and the, the role in literacy and comprehension. And um, this is a book that our teachers requested to read and, uh, and do as a study group and um, uh, we got 
uh, Natalie Wexler to actually do the presentation on uh, Tuesday. So she's going to be zoomed in live to the uh, Mailey Auditorium and all of our K through five teachers who work with students around ELA. So that's uh, classroom teachers, Title I teachers, um, special educators, anybody who is working with kids around literacy um, will be there. And it's two part. One is to uh, have a presentation uh, from Natalie Wexler relative to the book that she wrote, and everybody will have a copy, get a copy of this as well. Um, part two, and then some QA. And that sets the stage for the pilot update for the ELA pilot that you've heard about. Um, that is the moment where the coaches and I will share. Um, this is sort of setting the stage for why are we changing our uh, adopting a new ELA program that has at its focus uh, a lot more of the knowledge building that we recognized um, has been missing. Uh, that's how the two are connected. We'll then spend an hour talking about our uh, professional development plan, a rollout plan, what to expect, and, and those kinds of things. So that's, that will be happening at the Amelia Auditorium. And okay, oh, there's Katie. Um, Katie, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about uh, the one of the big pieces that you have going on as well as the ESP training. Sure, thank you, Greg. Sorry I'm not there in person. I'm getting over a cold, so I've been wearing a mask all day and I'm hoping to not, not spread my germs in person. Um, so one of the things we've been really working towards is making sure that we are supporting our ESPs our, our, um, with really some strong professional development going forward and meeting their needs for supporting our diverse learners. So we have a few options for paraprofessionals coming up um, for, the new, for the PD day. So we have visualizing problem solving from concrete to abstract for, um, which is gonna be presented by Nicole Bridge. Um, and that is a Zoom session. We also have supporting ELLs with special needs for um, students with pre, in, pre, in K to five. Um, creating predictability and safety for our students in uncertain times. So we've been partnering with the North Shore Consortium and Jen Orlando, and she is part of what's called the Connections Program at the North Shore Consortium. So she is supporting us with social emotional needs this year, as well as has, has offered to provide some professional development for our teachers in regards to really supporting with creating predictability and safety and routines for how we're coming out of the pandemic. So for our students that are in preschool and kindergarten and first grade and really have, there's been a great impact around regulation, how they regulate themselves, how they attend, um, and what that impact has really had on their learning and how, strategies for supporting them. Um, in addition for special education teachers, we and all special education staff, we do have Michael Joyce coming out from um, he's an attorney that's going to be coming out and doing some tips and tricks and strategies for special education law and really ensuring that we have strong IEPs that are developed for, for students going forward. Thank you, Katie. I see Andrew's here. I just want to wrap this up, but um, thank you, Greg and Katie. Um, what we have on the screen here is just a little bit about how it's organized so you can see organized by grade span. There are programs for that are specifically for teachers, special education teachers, specialists, professionals, administrative assistants, or school secretaries. Um, and then as you've heard already, um, aligned with many of the things that you've been learning about from us this year and focusing on terms of our priorities. Um, Star 360, program on that, literacy, literacy instruction at the middle school, and then the areas that um, Katie and Greg talked about in terms of uh, moving forward and our support of education students and especially you know, writing effective IEPs and then tied to the literacy instruction, our, our ELA pilot, and also tied at the high school to oh, tied and, and actually in, across many grades, you know, how are we responding and supporting students during the pandemic? So really, you know, very closely tied all year and the ongoing work we have. So um, it's really, when I first saw the plan last week, because Katie, Amy, principals and others, you know, and Greg work on this, um, 
I said, I really need to, sh we need to show this to you and show this to the community because it's so well organized, so thorough, so, so diverse, and so comprehensive. So I want to make sure you saw that. I'll turn this off. And because I see Andrew's there. It's not a quarter okay. minute. Wait, can I trade? Can I ace this in the text? You know, trade. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's bad. Andrew, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for coming. Andrew, that was your fault. Nope, nope, Andrew, nothing to bad. Everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrew Quelo. I'm here representing the executive board of student council. And I'm just here to report on the things we've been doing in the last few days. We've had a really successful week at GHS. We've had, we started up MCAS testing and we had a successful blood drive last week. Um, but throughout this week, we've been practicing for the NHS induction there's going to be held tomorrow. I believe we have 43 new inductees for NHS, which is really exciting. Um, on March 29th, we're planning on doing, a, NHS is planning on doing a cleanup throughout the day of GHS. And we also have the GHS theaters program, Spring Musical Footloose. They're performing next weekend on Thursday, March 31st at 7 p.m., Friday, April 1st at 7 p.m., and Saturday, April 2nd at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. And um, as Miss Clancy mentioned before, we had our hockey team that made a really good run in the playoffs and kind of brought that, that school spirit within all of us. And as she mentioned before, we also had our national team, our track team qualify for nationals it was our sprint medley team and our uh, fre girls freshman Sky Shalino. And that was really nice. We got to go out to New York and it was the first time that we had qualified for nationals in five years. So that was really nice as well. Andrew, can you mention who's on the relay team? Yeah, uh, on the sprint medley relay team, it's Aiden Almeida, Sam Ashwell, Colby Rochford, and then me. And then Sky Shalino was racing in the freshman 400. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Looking Thank forward to NHS inductions and and the spring musical as well. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Good night. Um, the next item of business, we will have a presentation from the Gloucester Education Foundation. Emily Siegel is the executive director, and Anna O'Connor is the incoming board president. Yes. So, hi, my name is Anna O'Connor, and I presently serve as the president and board of directors of Foster Education Foundation. I joined uh, the foundation eight years ago, um, shortly after I had retired um, from the Gloucester Public Schools after serving 35 years as an educator and an administrator in the district. Um, uh, being a native of Gloucester, um, and graduating from Gloucester High. My husband and I raised our children here, and now we have grandchildren that are in the school. And um, actually this year we'll be celebrating three generations of graduates from Gloucester High School because our granddaughter is graduating. Yeah. Um, so it's an honor to be part of this incredible foundation um, with not only the strong support that we have with the district, with Ben, with Greg and the entire district, but also with the amazing generosity and support that we have from our community that, um, that truly cares about education. And so tonight, um, Emily, our executive director is going to be presenting um, some of the programs and the work that we've been doing with the district. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And do you prefer the group that I'm presenting to you or to the screen? I think to us. To us? Okay, okay. great. Um, so Ben's going to pull up some slides, but uh, just by introduction, because I don't know all of you, I'm Emily Siegel, uh, and I've been the executive director at the Gloucester Education Foundation since the start of the school year, uh, taking the reins from the wonderful uh, Aria McElhenney, who remains involved and a, and a great support to me and to others um, at the foundation. 
Um, I worked in education for 15 years um, as an after school teacher and program director, um, and then in public policy um, in, across Massachusetts, but primarily in Cambridge and Boston. Um, and then was working um, statewide with districts on school redesign work, um, as well as in a few other states around the country. Um, and then uh, I, I took a hiatus from education work to open a nonprofit in and retreat center. Coincidentally, in an abandoned elementary school uh, in the middle of the desert in rural Arizona. Um, and I did that for six years and the, the call of home brought me back here um, and my family lives in Rockport. So being back uh, in Massachusetts and settling in Cape Ann has been really wonderful. Um, my son is a kindergartner at Plum Cove um, as of January 3rd and my daughter will follow suit in a few years. So <laughs> proud also to be a foster parent. Um, okay, so I'm going to provide an update tonight um, about the work GEF is doing. I know GEF is very familiar to some of you and perhaps newer to others. Um, so Ben, if you want to pull us forward. Um, just to share our mission, vision, and values um, as a refresher. So we serve to drive innovation, encourage creativity, expand student opportunities, and empower educators to improve teaching and learning in the Gloucester Public Schools. Our vision is that students in the district will be engaged in and enthusiastic about their education, prepared to reach their fullest potential, and dedicated to community engagement. And our core values that guide our work are leadership, integrity, culture of excellence, and community engagement. Uh, so since its founding in 2006, uh, somebody asked the other day, when's our 15th anniversary party going to happen? And sadly, we had to be like, oh, that passed. And we'll have to wait for the 20th. But uh, since the founding more than 15 years ago, um, I'm so excited to share this figure. We've raised over $9 million uh, to support programs in the Gloucester Public Schools. When I started in August, we were using the phrase over $8 million. And then we looked closely and it was over 8.7. And then I looked again yesterday and I was like, oh, we've had a couple of good years of fundraising. We're over $9 million at this point. Um, this year, our fiscal year ends next week. Um, so these numbers are pretty solid for the end of our FY22. We're on track to raise over $616,000. Um, and that's due, as Anna said, to the incredible generosity of this community, individuals, organizations, businesses, um, a few foundations, and most are based right here in Gloucester. So we're really a foundation um, of this community for this community. And I've just been so uh, impressed with just how committed this community is to its schools. So to share some just historic program highlights, I think um, GEF has been well known as um, an organization that funds a lot of STEM and arts programs. Those have been our two main areas of focus um, over the past 15 years. See some photos here um, from the aquaponics lab over at O'Malley, 3D printing. Um, in, on the art side, um, funding visiting artists to come into schools. You can see the, uh, the acorn press from the old Folly Coke printers uh, that's housed at O'Malley, um, as well as events like Countdown to Kindergarten that engage families and get students and their parents really excited about um, entering the Gloucester Public Schools. Um, but I want to share some of the things we're doing now as we um, add on to the arts and STEM work that we're doing. Um, so these are some photos from this year. Um, so some current program highlights, I'll just walk you through these and you might see some familiar faces. Top left, this is the Gordon Summer STEM program um, that's at the Beeman School that started as a Beeman only program and has expanded over the years um, with support from um, the Gordon Foundation um, to serve fourth and fifth graders in the summer um, doing STEM and engineering work. In the middle on the top there, those are Plum Cove students um, reading from amazing new books supplied by the Art for Equity program, um, which was GF's first grant to a student, Mila Barry, to um, do a combination of public art projects and then using the proceeds to buy books um, by diverse authors of color, queer authors, um, and make sure that our school libraries and classrooms are stocked with really rich literature um, that reflect the students in our classrooms. On the right, you can see O'Malley Academy doing some hands-on cooking, uh, healthy cooking with a uh, partner of the Open Door. In the middle, instrumental music. We've been really proud this year. We've raised $62,000 um, to support instrumental music lessons for grades four through eight. Um, and grades four and five, that was really on hold during the pandemic, as I'm sure you're all aware. And uh, the middle school band leader came to us in the fall and said, we're at risk of losing a generation of youth musicians. There's no feeder into the middle school band program 
And if there's no strong middle school program, there's no feeder to the high school and the doc side just doesn't have any experienced musicians. Um, so we worked hard and scrambled this fall to find money to uh, support lessons for fourth, fifth, fourth and fifth graders, and then also more um, individualized instruction for sixth, seventh and eighth graders. Um, to the right of that are kids in the auto tech program at the high school. Um, the Lion Wah Auto Group um, just wrapped up a really generous three-year $150,000 gift through GEF uh, to enhance the auto tech program. And um, not official yet, uh, but they have committed uh, to another three years to wow. do that just recently. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, and that's to grow that program and allow for two teachers so that the students are doing more hands-on work, less looking and watching and more actually getting their hands greasy and doing. Bottom left, you can see uh, the digital photo lab at the high school, which um, got a complete equipment upgrade um, this past fall. And then lower right, this is the, um, the DECA kids, including Anna's granddaughter, um, who were at the state um, tournament, what was that, just two weeks ago? Yes. Um, and this is an example, I think, of like the kinds of things we're funding, you know, as we're in and coming through the pandemic that are a little different than some of our traditional programming. Um, but that the, the pandemic made necessary, right? So DECA so it would normally be funded through boosters and student fundraising. That was really hard to do during the pandemic and continues to be. And GEF wanted to acknowledge that and make sure that all students have the opportunity to participate in that, even though it's not a program we've typically funded. So here's a full funding list of um, this school year thus far, September through March 23rd, what we funded, 21 programs. Um, some of the ones I just spoke about are up there. A couple other ones to call out. The new GHS Mentor Project um, is a new one-on-one -on -one mentoring program supporting um, juniors and seniors and uh, developing post-secondary plans in partnership with Wellspring House. And that's been many years in the making uh, and is finally launching the um, new mentor training this next week with 15 community mentors that will work side by side with students here at the high school. Um, the Gender Equity in STEM Club is um, uh, up and running here at the high school. And through that, um, students of all gender identities are looking at careers in STEM fields and what are the gender dynamics that come into play um, that impact um, people's ability to progress in those fields. Um, and is there one more I wanted to call out? Uh, the Mindful Toolkit. So um, G GF has funded for a couple of years now um, Noam Graham, who's a community educator, to do mindfulness work in the schools. And it feels like it's really nicely related to a lot of the other mental health and wellness work that, um, that, that GVS is doing. But uh, Noam has been working in three elementary schools this, this year. And it's a nice uh, extension of something that had to be fully virtual last year. And now she's able to actually go into classrooms and work with students. So um, GEF uh, in January um, finalized a strategic plan that's been a long time in the making, uh, as Anna can attest to. And the work on this started um, last year, took a pause during parts of the pandemic, started back up again. Um, and we've just finalized um, a three-year strategic plan that really focuses in on the three areas of our organization. And I want to just focus on programs tonight because I think it relates most closely to obviously your work as a school committee. Um, but up here are the four kind of big picture goals um, of what GEF is looking to do around programs over the next three years. And some of this will feel really familiar. And some of it I think is um, GEF pushing themselves to work in a, in a different way as the organization becomes more sophisticated. Um, so as always, we're looking to fund a diversity of programs. Um, and I think the key words here are all students and active engaged learning. I feel like that's sort of the hallmark of GEF programs is a GEF funded program, you'll typically see kids out of their seats doing, performing, experimenting, whether it's in the arts or sciences or another field. Um, and we really want to make sure that all types of students and learners are, are being able to participate in those programs, um, including vulnerable learners, English language learners, special education students, and low-income students. The second one, um, GF would really like to support two to three, over the next three years, two to three really big transformational ideas. So this idea of like district-wide initiatives, that cross multiple grades, multiple subject areas, and have this potential to shift district culture in lasting ways. And um, you know, GEF's early work, the C initiative was something that, that GEF um, did in its early years. That was a big district-wide science initiative. And I think there's a lot of interest um, in, in trying to get a few more big initiatives like that off the ground in the coming years. 
This third one, um, which I know is of great interest to this group and to district leadership, is just making sure that there's a really clear focus on the transitions of students as they transition into kindergarten, middle school, high school, and beyond. And so knowing that those are challenging points for students, for teachers, and for families, as a new kindergarten parent, I can attest to this, right? Like, I you say five-year-old. Um, and so, you know, these, these transition years are, are so critical. Um, and also thinking about the vertical alignment. What does a coherent K-12 experience look like? Um, and what are the touch points along the ways of those key milestone years? Um, so we were really excited that Craig submitted this great proposal to us, which was funded in full for this celebration of learning for fifth and sixth graders this June. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to the committee about that, but a really interesting way to bring together the fifth and sixth grade committee in the O'Malley building um, and to think about learning, not just as teacher to student, but student to student, parent to student, teacher to student to family. Um, so those kinds of programs. And then lastly, just making sure we're really articulate about the idea that we're always working in close partnership with the district. Um, ben, Greg, Anna, and I meet monthly. Uh, we talk far more frequently than that. This is my third day in a row with Ben. <laughs> um, and, and making sure that we're, we're working together, that it's not transactional, right? That it's collaborative. And that it's not just for the sake of saying we work together, but it's really in service mm -hmm. of one another's shared goals. So we've carefully followed Ben's entry plan and now his plan for continuous improvement. Um, and we're making sure that we're supporting the goals of this district through the programs that we fund. So the next two slides I only included just so people could have copies of them. I'm not going to go through them, but these are the other goals around external affairs, how we interact with the public, with the community, with our donors. And then the last one is internal affairs. How do we govern our organization so that it's sustainable, it's fiscally sound, um, leadership is stable, so we're around for 15 plus more years to support the Gloucester schools. So to close, um, just thinking about our impact, I think people often think about GS impact when, when that question is posed, it's like, how many students are served? What are students learning? What are students getting? Of course, that's important, but GEF, you know, the impact touches so many different kinds of stakeholders in Gloucester. It's not just students. So of course, we're increasing opportunity for students to participate in those active engaged learning experiences in school, out of school, um, like in O'Malley Academy in the summer. Um, but we're also empowering educators. So in communities where there's no ed foundation, where a teacher can apply um, and say, I have this brilliant idea and I want to do this thing, like that dream dies. <laughs> um, so to have an ed foundation that encourages teachers to dream big and then can match those ideas with resources and support is hugely important. Um, attracting and retaining families, one of our, our big priorities is making sure families know this is an amazing school district. You know, Gloucester is a wonderful community, but also that the schools here offer things that are unique to the region and unique to the state. We always want to serve as a, a partner to school and district leaders, the principals, um, you know, department heads, Greg and Ben, um, can really kind of help them bring the outside the box ideas to life. Um, because of the constraints of a budget, the constraints of a work day, sometimes it can be hard to pursue those ideas. And we hope we're seen as a, a partner that can help you make those things happen. And lastly, I think we're, we're an entry point for the Gloucester community into schools. We have a lot of funders who don't have kids in the school system. We have funders who send their kids to private school. We have funders whose kids have graduated. We have funders who are retirees who raise their kids in another community. But people give to GEF because they want to support the schools and they see that as a doorway in. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we are serving as that entry point for donors, for volunteers, and, and champions of our schools and our kids. I will end there. And Anna and I can take any questions you might have. Not really much just to sing it. Um, so I was on the school committee in 2006 when Ed Shokia first came and presented to us with this idea for an Ed Foundation. And at that time, the economy was really not doing so great. We were cutting. We were lucky to get a level service budget, let alone a level funded budget year after year. Um, we came forward with this idea, and now to see nine million dollars and 15 years later. You know, here we are still, and you guys are like so integrated into the school and the city. It's amazing. But as I said, back then, you, the purpose was to help fund things we just couldn't afford, but things we had to cut. And now we're looking at the extras that you provided for us. So I think the next 15 years are going to be even better. So thank you for all the work.
Thank you. That, that's good to hear that historical perspective. As a new person, sometimes I can lose sight of the fact that this started as a little idea 15 years ago um, under much different circumstances than we are now. And I was an educator, so I remember yeah, those days. The hard times. <laughs> the hard times. Yeah. I don't have a question, but I just want to follow along with Greg's lead because I've been on the committee 14 years. I can't tell you how wonderful Anna it is to see you again. Same here. I've seen you in so Same long. Here. And I, I am beyond impressed how this presentation tonight, it's like you two have been here forever. You know, you, you know this foundation, the way you're um, encouraging and, and talking about donors and things like that. It's like, it's like you've been here for a while, even though you're new faces. But beyond impressed, Warren Law will forever impress me as well. Yes. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of good work coming from your foundation. And I can't even imagine what our schools would be like without that foundation. Because like Greg said, back when you began, we, we were making cuts in everything we were doing. And this was that shining light that came forward and it's still here, bigger and brighter. And it's just awesome. So thank you ladies for your dedication because you're touching a lot of students every day in the things that you do. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, similar. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. So I graduated from Gloucester High School in 2004, and then the Gloucester Education Foundation came in in 2006. So I look at these opportunities, and there was nothing like that. You know, when I, I had a good education, but the enrichment act, um, opportunities were very, very different. Um, and as a parent of a kindergartner, and then someday another kindergartner in two years, I'm just so grateful that they're going to have those opportunities in this district. Um, both as a graduate of this community and also as a parent. So thank you for your hard work. Laura? So I echo my colleagues. <laughs> thank you, Greg. <laughs> um, I echo my colleagues, you know, everything that, you know, from, from power of play, which hasn't happened. Yeah. I don't think, you know, there's so many pieces yeah. of what the Gloucester Education Foundation has brought to the schools. I actually do have a question. Um, uh, as a first and third grade parent um, at one of the schools, one thing I've wondered about is um, some projects go to some elementary schools and not others. Um, and I'm sort of wondering how that's determined and why that is, and sort of how we can sort of equalize that a little more. Yeah, I think it's a great question um, and, and, a, and a valid concern, right, to want to make sure kids are having equitable experiences across all the elementary schools. So in general, the way that projects originate for GEF, and this is by design, is that teachers come to us. Teachers or district leaders or principals come to us. And there have been lots and lots of times that somebody in the community or somebody on our board has had this great idea. And unless that idea finds a champion within a school, whether it's a classroom teacher or support staff or administrator, it's not going to get traction. So by design, teachers and, and school staff come to us with proposals. Um, I think that I think GEF can do more um, to get out and make sure that teachers are aware of the opportunity, aware that our, our grant application process is not a huge heavy lift. Um, that's not to say it's not extra work for a teacher. And I think especially over the past two years, that's been a difficult proposition. But um, I think we can do more to make sure teachers are aware. I think that um, in our work, my work with the principals, making sure that the principals are really identifying, like, are there ideas and sparks that they're seeing that a little bit of a connection and a little bit of a push could get a teacher to actually apply for the funds. And then going back to this idea of sort of like the big ideas, the transformational district wide, I think we're really looking for more of those. Um, and I think we'll look to, to the district and the school leaders in particular to see, you know, what are these things with the new ELA curriculum rolling out? Is there something to supplement that um, that could um, help bring that literature alive across all of the elementary schools, for example, that isn't in the budget, but is something that, that we could step in and support. So I think it's, it's both of those that come from both ends. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Does that, does that answer? I, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Emily. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, some things I wanted to ask you about and some things I wanted to thank you for. I mean, my, my son's going to be in fourth grade next year. So hearing about that connection between uh, each of the grade levels that, you know, the, um, with the uh, musical education going, uh, you know, progressing through, through the grade levels. It's, as, as a casual musician myself, you know, teaching my kids to like, play keyboard and stuff like that. 
to see that there's an outlet for that at such a young age, I think is really important to foster that through their lives. Um, and also I wanted to ask about the, um, the Gordon STEM summer program. Is that something associated with Gordon College? No. Okay, I, I was wondering what the Gordon was. Yeah, no, Gordon that. is the, the name of the funder. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? What, Sure. Um, so, and others should chime in because I'm I'm still fairly new. So I have yeah. actually I got to visit this program before. Right when I came on board last summer, I got to visit it once. But um, it's a program that is um, housed at the Beeman School. Um, is at this point open to students across the district, even though it originally started with just Beeman students, led by teachers. Um, and is Greg? Are they still doing a series of one week sessions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about. Well, you're, you're welcome to. Do the intro and then I can share a little bit more if you like. Um, a series of sessions throughout the summer um, with kids doing um, hands on STEM learning using a Museum of Science curriculum. Um, and I'll, I'll yeah. pass to Greg. Um, and over the last few years, um, they've done a series of, of one week um, over the course of five weeks, they've done sort of one week modules that students could sign up for four days. Um, and they are um, Think about adjusting this year, maybe two week stretches so that there's a little bit less uh, coming and going as hard to manage. Uh, the other thing that I will note for this summer, uh, that program expanded significantly last year. Um, this year, it's going to not be quite as big, uh, but we'll still accept um, and, and encourage students from all schools to come, but it won't have as many classrooms because um, and this is good news, the Beeman School is projected to have uh, construction happening on the modulars. Uh, so we're going to be doing some shifting of the, um, uh, some of the programs to West Parish. Science will stay there, but we needed to have it have a little bit smaller footprint for, for this summer. Uh, so we'll still have it open to everybody, but a smaller number overall. And then hopefully build the uh, foundation for just re-expanding next summer um, with uh, you know more classes running simultaneously. And the funder is somebody who made his career in engineering. Um, oh. So he specifically cares deeply about the yeah. engineering aspect. Of awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emily and Anna. Um, I almost feel like I have to make a statement, <laughs> but I really don't believe me. Um, great work. I, I did write down a couple of notes. One of the things I wrote down is, is programs ever run their course? I mean, is there a review of the programs and you say, you know what, this really just doesn't happen? Yes. What, is, what does that look like internally? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, again, being new, I'm going to speak from what I've seen and heard that Anna can chime in. Anna has chaired our programs committee for a number of years. Um, but there are certainly programs that are experimented with, right? Like there's some R&D that happens through GPF funding and like didn't quite work. And maybe it can be tweaked and, and revisited and done in a slightly different shape. Or maybe it just it, either there isn't the demand or isn't the need or the execution just isn't where it needs to be. Um, and then there's things that go on year after year and are improved upon. Um, and we have some programs that we we earmark funding for each year, um, like elementary theater. Like we're every year in our budget, we have slated that each elementary school will get money for that, so they can plan ahead of time. They know that money is there, um, and it looks a little bit different at each school every year, but they can count on those funds. China. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking, you know, there's been programs that have been in the district for a long, very long time. Like, for example, the mad hot ball that we always had in fifth grade. But of course, we haven't had that for the past two years because of, um, you know, COVID. And it's not taking place this year because everything's been so iffy. So that might be one of the programs that might be looked at to see, you know, whether that's something they want to continue with or if they want to do something else that, you know, brings the fifth graders and the district together. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the only other thing I had is I, I read about when I first came on the school, I read about the mentoring program, which I think is a great idea. I mean, most of my most of my associates in Boston are friends of successful guys that have done well in their lives, just have excellent role models. And I'm always interested in programs that kind of serve underserved kids or and connecting them to people that are successful as kind of uh, examples for them. So, Certainly support that. If, if 
if I twisted some arms and said, hey, I want you to get involved in this program with the GEF, what would that look like? Would I say, go, go see Emily? Yep. <laughs> no, <laughs> thankfully you don't have to say that. Um, so that program is really unique. It's a three-way partnership between the Gloucester High School Counseling Department, yep. GEF, and Wellspring House. And each partner brings something a little bit different to the table. We bring funding and some support with mentor recruitment. Um, Wellspring House houses a coordinator. Uh, her name is Valerie Rafferty, and GEF helped hire her. Um, James Cook and Laura Cross from the high school sat in on those interviews, so we made sure we had someone we all felt great about. And Valerie is a Wellspring employee, um, but is here at the high school many days a week um, and is the coordinator for that program. So she's V Rafferty at GloucesterSchools.com. I can send that to whoever I need to to get that out. Um, but people who are interested can go right to Valerie. And there's, I will say, like, there's an application process. There's screening. Everyone, obviously, Corey, sorry, fingerprint. Um, there's um, an orientation, as I said, which is next week. So it's, it's a commitment. And mentors are committing to about an hour a week for a year and a half to two years. So this is this program has been designed really to build relationships between successful people in the community who found success in a whole variety of fields um, to inspire and coach and cheerlead and sit by the side of a high school student who just is tearing their hair out because they're not sure what they want to do or they know what they want to do, but they don't know how to get there. Um, and so Valerie will definitely be looking for mentors um, as this grows because there's a lot of demand on the student side. Mm -hmm. The counseling department is in charge of doing the referrals of students. Um, and making sure that they're supporting Valerie with the information that she needs to, to make the right matches. So they're all set for now, is what you're saying? I think they are, but I will check. Um, I would never say no to a volunteer who wants right. to get involved. Right. Right. Um, so I will email Valerie and check. I know um, my husband happens to be volunteering as a mentor, so I get the inside track on all of their schedules. So I happen to know they have a training next week. Um, and, uh, and we have a board member whose husband is also uh, doing that. So, my husband's club. <laughs> mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would just wrap or try to wrap it up um, by saying I, I can't I can't thank GF enough. It's just the two of you representing them. Um, uh, you, know, you are our GF is our central partner. And for so many reasons. One, you are a tremendous champion uh, of our schools and our educators and our students, all the great work that is done, um, especially the great work that, you, that, that GF supports. Um, you connect so many people to our schools to help them channel their uh, desire to, 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 to be connected, to support, to work with. Um, you are a tremendous thought partner um, for us, uh, for, for principals, for district leadership, um, and you also push us. You push us to be better. You push us to be more ambitious. Um, and you always are pushing us to be, as you said here, um, to develop programming that's actively engaged kids in really, really meaningful learning experiences. And that is what we want to happen every day for every student in every classroom. And uh, 15 years now, GF has been um, just tried and true uh, champions of that. So um, our deepest thanks. Proud to do it. And I won't say anything because I see you right here. <laughs> um, I do want to acknowledge and thank Kathy uh, for bringing the school committee perspective to us, for being really engaged in the work that we do, um, for bringing her perspective as a parent. Um, we bring it all. Um, it adds a lot to the organization. Well, I think this is a perfect forum to let the community know more about what the foundation is about, as well as educators and, uh, and definitely the school committee, so that they can speak as um, enthusiastic and knowledgeable as, as possible. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. You're <laughs> <laughs> welcome to stay. You're welcome to leave. I didn't want to be rude and pop out. No. Onward? Onward. So we'll move on to uh, just where things stand as we launch. Um, MCAS this week, just to give a committee uh, an update and a schedule. Um, this is sort of, uh, this is, this is the, the, the most basic piece of the schedule you see. GHS grade 10 ELA started this week, uh, last two days, uh, yesterday and today. Uh, we moved into grade 10 math in May and then uh, grade 9 biology uh, in June. Um, 
And then uh, grade 6 through 8 ELA, that is not March 28th, that's March 28th through April 29th. There's a window, that the state gives us a window on when to admit those tests. Typically we go later in the window, but it varies. Um, Greg uh, is a big supporter of this. I mean, a, 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 not, a, not a big <laughs> proponent of it, supporter of our school teams and administration. April 5th. Yeah, there April 5th. There you go. Uh, starting with that. So you, we're going across all those grades within that window. Um, and then uh, math is essentially the following month, April 25th to May 27th, science, technology, engineering grades five and eight, it's not five through eight, five and eight is uh, that window's April is really the month of May. Um, you know, these are uh, really um, demanding of school administration teachers, of all school community, really, in terms of um, the focus on it, uh, disruption to the schedule, um, the time amount of time it takes for, you know, uh, any individual student, it's not a ton of time, but across the whole school, it has an impact, an uh, ongoing impact, especially, um, you know, you see at the high school for those days, it's, it's, it really shifts the schedule for everybody. Um, but it's, you know, pretty limited for a couple days each month, whereas the um, elementary um, uh, and middle schools are a lot more intensive, basically. So just want to, you folks know, that's part of the context of what folks are experiencing now or will be experiencing soon, um, and that always impacts just um, uh, in the normal routine. And anything that impacts the normal routine, especially something that, that you know, is, is a... a Exam like this um, really impacts the learning, impacts uh, teachers, impacts students, that sort of stuff. It can impact families, as some of you know. Um, so I wanted to just make sure everyone knew that was that's you know underway basically. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. you got it. Yeah. Um, Mike, so Greg or Ben, um, was it is it this the first year without the um, high school technology exam, right? So. Used to be there were two science exams in the high school that kids could take to meet yeah. the science. So if it's one of if our students are not on the biology track, does that impact their graduation requirements from a um, state? MPS? No, and I wish uh, James were here to talk about the nuances of that. I'm afraid I don't know the but it's, details. It's of not that. detrimental. No, it does not. No, I know okay. that. Okay. Sure. So I was going to ask. Uh, I'll be with that a little bit. Um, through COVID, didn't they relax a little restrictions for the MPS? Not, not th this year. We're all good. I was going to say, so is, are we back to regular Last MPS? year we had um, uh, the session lengths were reduced or from um, three to two sessions. Um, we also were allowed to do a remote uh, okay. last year. So those were the yeah. two big differences. And of course, there wasn't the accountability uh, directly attached to it. So we are back yeah. to 12. So this year there's no change. It's back to the original. Back to the original format. format length. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So a uh, COVID update. Um, continue to do our free at home rapid tests. Um, uh, the virus, here's a, the latest biobot, continues to go down. Um, uh, two weeks ago, no, three weeks ago, we were at 180,000 samples per liter of wastewater and now we're at 117,000 <clears> which is last Friday again can you just go down um but at, but um which and this is probably the more the most reliable indicator across the community because as I mentioned before we now have some people taking rapid tests those aren't typically reported to the Department of Health okay um do a lot of reporting in our schools folks are, are good at letting us know which is great but um only PCR tests have always it's only been PCR tests that have been reported in the state, and those used to be the preponderance of tests, and, that, and now uh, less so. So we have to keep a really close eye on this. Um, you see an uptick here. Um, two weeks ago, we were concerned about um, a I'm sure what the right uh, uptick uh, at the high school among a, a you know, small, a certain group of students involved in, in a certain activity. Um, that's resolved itself, um, and we had kept close watch on it. I gave you a sort of update on what we were doing. We're doing a similar approach at, at veterans now in terms of knowing which classrooms or grades, contacting families, offering initial testing, letting them to take home multiple tests to test the old, you know, coming days, that sort of stuff, and also keeping a close eye on things. Um, yesterday, with the pool testing at veterans, we got the results back today. There were no new positives, positives from the pool testing at veterans. That's a good sign. But there were a couple more positives from rapid tests today. So, um, so again, keep like, 
we were doing with the high school two weeks ago, now keeping a very close eye on veterans. Um, you know, people are talking about this new variant um, of Omicron that's out there and more contagious. So, um, you know, we're keeping a close eye and we're doing um, just what I've been reporting, which is this week, uh, Jeff Parker reached out to uh, Desi to ask him about veterans. Um, he's been sitting down, you know, both yesterday and today with the nurse, with Karen, nurse uh, Karen over there, understanding, you know, what grades and what classes, what information we can get from families about um, connections, okay, that sort of thing between students or staff. Um, so that's, that's the identified patterns and causes and then responding. And the responding at this point continues to be, Matt Busco communi communicated to um, veterans families yesterday, encouraging mask wearing, um, making sure they know what the status is of COVID in the school, um, and then also communicating with families and, and providing more tests and that sort of thing. And where possible, suggesting to get them uh, signed up for uh, either or, or both their pool testing, their rapid testing, and as well as giving them rapid tests if they're not, they're not participating now. So. Um, and that, and we'll, I would expect we'll see that sort of process uh, continue on. Um, I you know uh, I will say this: um, if you remember when we had the mass discussion, uh, just for February break, I did highlight that a few weeks after February break last year there was an uptick. Okay, that's happened twice now. It's really the same time frame as a year ago. I'm not sure if that's a connection. It's just interesting, you know, to note that. Um, after that, the cases went down uh, for the rest of the year. So I'm looking at the bio report, it's really low. You look at the graph and we're on the bottom and then Ben on the bottom. Yeah. So when I hear these words uptick, like uptick means five cases, not 50 cases, like it might have meant last year. I'm just well, I, I just I'm, see I'm specifically I have for this, I'm specifically talking at, at better. When I say uptick, I mean veterans. You know, I mean, listen, yeah. we went from 8 to 31 cases, you know, in, in, in two weeks, you know, that's an uptick, right? Right. But what because, I'm talking Because it went up. Yeah, because it went up. Yeah, okay. yeah. Not, I don't want to say surge, I don't want to say spike. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. the right word here, you know? I, uptick, I'm a <laughs> word, but I'm using it. You know, because I don't want to overstate it. <laughs> right. But it's, you know, as I'm being clear with you folks, like, like we're paying attention to veterans, you know, that's a concern. No, you no, know? so I yeah. get that. So I guess my, I, my question is, I'm trying to find the question. Yeah. So knowing that, COVID is with us forever, never going away. So we're always going to have this because it's like the flu. We always have the flu. We're always going to have COVID. That's a yeah, fact. That's right. out there. That's that's the way of the world, right? I'm curious to know what DESE regulations are now. Like, are we still doing contact tracing? Are we at a point where, yeah, you can recommend a mask just because people are getting them. So if anybody has COVID, I guess you would wear a mask around them. But I just want to make sure no, that we're not... What, the CDC isn't requiring masks. Nobody's requiring masks. So I just kind of want to stay on that path and not get parents upset. But at the same time, report what's actually happening. Yeah. So what what regulations does DESE have over this point? Like you're calling DESE. Is there a certain benchmark where they oh. say, put the masks on, shut the schools down still? Yeah. Or are we doing you know, contact tracing, all done with that? And it's just a matter of, yeah. okay, a couple of kids have it. You might want to wear a mask. Yeah, so, so we call testing this sort of situation for two reasons. One, access from them to the Department of Public Health and epidemiologists in okay. case we need that. Okay. okay. So the first two questions to DESE, to DESE or our contact there is um, anything else we should be doing to like, report what we're doing, anything else we should be doing, and do you think it's worth uh, either getting state, some state testing in here, okay, or um, also talking to epidemiologists. And, that, and that's where, that's, and that's sort of, sort of like, that's what's happening. Uh, any thoughts, suggestions, what else to do, really? Okay. In terms of any sort of regulations from DESI now, it's more, it's all encouragement, you know, creating distancing as possible, okay? Um, you know, and, and some classes do that, some classes don't, and, you know, and, and they sort of vary. Um, uh, in terms of masks, uh, that is still, it, whether it's COVID or other airborne diseases, masks help reduce that. Okay, they don't eliminate it, okay, but they help reduce that. Um, it's commonly, as I described, it's commonly used in, in many other countries in terms of when folks are you know, recovering from illness or have illness in their home. Um, so we suggest that, and that's still, we all, I think we will continue as we have COVID here um, as, as a practice that, that families can, can choose if they want to. Um, you know, and that's, and that's consistent with what folks decided and what we've been saying all along. Um, it's not a mandate, it's a suggestion, and it's a, it's a you know, that, that families have. So do you see this as a suggestion forever now? 
Well, I know you mentioned flu. I don't think um, you know that COVID is where flu is yet, um, especially because we've been here before and COVID, you know, did things differently. You know, so um, and it certainly is um, uh, has been deadlier than the flu. Don't know where it is now. So we, I think, it's really prudent for us to remain vigilant um, until there is more of a, more time. I mean, we are not far away from the most serious you know, number of cases we've ever had. I mean, it's a recent past is now. So um, that's the difference, I think, is because we don't know where it's headed. You know, flu, I, I mean, again, I'm not a public health official, but flu is very consistent and has been for years, you know, um, in terms of what we expect, what happens. Um, it's deadly as well, especially among older folks, um, as we know. Um, <coughs> But uh, it's it's a much more consistent. My believe my thinking here again. I'm not a public health official. Um, it's a much more consistent uh, uh, disease that we're at much more familiar with. I was just trying to gauge you to see if we're on a path where you're going to be recommending masks because there is a flu outbreak and things like that. Like in other words, are you suggesting that recommending masks is going to be in the schools forever? depending on the illnesses that are coming at us. I know we don't know about enough about COVID right now. It hasn't been here long enough. You know, I think, um, I don't know what, what some of the lasting impacts of COVID, of this pandemic have been, you know? And one of them certainly could be that in our society, people just have a, more of a common practice of wearing masks when they have illness or recovering from illness, you know? Um, I don't know that, you know? But, but for the time being, especially this year, um, we'll continue to encourage folks as you know as an option for them yeah. if it's for their, them and their family. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, ben, quickly, uh, uh, veterans is, is 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 the school that they're in Saint Anne's is is the is that footprint smaller than the rest of the school? I mean, are those kids packed in more than at the other schools? Or? Not in the classrooms necessarily. You know, the classrooms are a good, healthy size. Um, I mean, you know large size, I mean, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's instead of, you know, if you think about our elementary schools and what they, what they have been like veterans, for example, you know, they're spread out on one, on one floor across a bigger footprint than St. Anthony's built up, obviously. Um, the hallways definitely are tighter, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, if there was any, I, I think this is true, okay, um, you know, if there was any, you um, issue with the building, I think you would have seen veterans, you know, having trouble all year long, and they just have it, they're no different than, in fact, maybe better off than some of the other schools, yeah. honestly, yeah. Okay. Uh, here you just see the number of cases, so 31 cases, that's comparable to where we were, were sort of, you know, late November, early December. Um, you mentioned that already. So you know, in school vaccination clinics, not a lot of folks, there are 43 people total that are in school vaccination clinics. That, that's a combination of first shot, second shot, or the adults most likely were, were boosted, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to move on to the 2023 budget. Next. Just a quick question on testing. Have those yeah. numbers, the pool and the rapids, have those numbers been sort of stable? Yeah, yes, all, all I can check the numbers um, today. Um, in terms of the um, in terms of registrations, it's pretty stable. Um, vaccinations is stable definitely as well. Um, this week, there were 831 swabs. So 830 individuals, you know, tested um, on Monday staff. Tuesday, sorry? Staff and students? Yeah, staff and students, right, staff and students. And there are five positives across all those. So of, of the 31 people you see that I just reported, five of those came from pool testing this week. That's a 0.6% positivity rate of those folks who were tested. And we still have, so so if it's about, step, we have about 50% involved in testing. That was where we were. 50% of students, um, yeah, involved in the rapid testing. And what about the pool testing? In pool testing, um, this number, 831, was uh, negatively affected by the MCAS at the high school, folks were in the middle of testing. Right. So I think we have about 1,000 people, you know, well, uh, more than 1,000 people registered. It varies how many folks are tested each, you know, each week, basically. But, so basically half of our... No, probably about more like a third is probably tested each week in terms of pool testing. Okay. So, but I'm saying as a district, we're somewhere around half of our students and staff being tested. 
Yeah, um, if you if you if you, you know, I don't know what the Venn diagram is literally between um, right. rapid right. testing and, and, right. and pool testing, but I think somewhere around half is probably is perhaps right. You know, you think fourteen hundred. In terms of rapid, sorry, rapid testing on staff is over 400, 440 folks at least, okay, of 630, so we're above half on that. Right. Okay? So, so In terms of students signed up, we're, I think we're at 14, 1,400, I think, and that's half. Okay. So in terms of rapid testing, we're right around half, I'd say, if I'm remember, remembering correctly, okay. uh, and pool testing is about a third. So I think that's, you know, if you look at both those combined. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, the budget. So I'll, um, a lot of this is similar to what folks, what the committee, full committee saw uh, uh, a few weeks ago. So, you know, the bottom line hasn't changed. Um, the basic approach hasn't changed. I'm still working through some details, but, but the numbers are, are very comparable. So just, um, I'm gonna give you an update first on the plan for ongoing improvement, because as I've talked about, the budget's linked to that and always will be, okay? So I just wanna give you a quick update on this, which is, um, I'll tie in later, I promise. Um, the process today, in terms of our plan for ongoing improvement, um, just a little background, September is when I presented my, my entry plan to the, um, to the committee and the public and the schools um, in October. And that began really, that kicked off the process for developing the plan for ongoing improvement, the three-year plan. In October, we have parent leader and community stakeholder groups provide input on, key prior, on the key priorities. November through March, um, uh, I met with uh, staff at each school, uh, typically myself, um, Katie Provo, and Greg Bach, with uh, support from Stephanie Lisi, met with folks. We met with more than 120 staff across all the schools, um, and they in shared input on the um, uh, on key priorities. We asked um, questions related, um, so as there are, um, so like, I'll give you one example. One question we asked across all schools was actually two of them was um, how can we uh, best support student social emotional learning and mental and mental health okay um and another one was how can we better connect general education special, special education um but then different grade levels or grade spans had, had some some that were you know closely aligned to that of, of, um, uh, particular uh, grade level um i'm trying to think we asked um one thing we asked uh, at the preschool and you'll hear more about this is about the building Okay, uh, the school committee asked us in the fall to get information input from the staff there about the buildings. That's one of the questions we asked them. A lot of input on that. Um, at the high school, it was tied to their um, their sustainable improvement plan. Um, so one of them was asking about you know how how can we um, make uh, sort of sustain a, a deeper um, uh, deeper hands on learning um, happen more systematically in the high school. That's a rephrasing of what actually was on the paper, but that's the that's tied to a sustainable improvement plan. Um, whatever the topic was, we asked essentially three questions in this, which is what are we doing now that's strong and that we should continue or, or make stronger? What should we stop doing and what should we start doing? Okay. So whether the topic was a special education or the topic was about interventions, or the topic was about um, a building, or the topic was um, related to uh, social emotional support. Those were the three questions asked about that topic. Um, these happen after school, outside the school day. It was optional for staff, um, not wanting to require them to come to um, you know additional meetings. Um, but I had some good turnout across the across the schools. And uh, one thing that was consistent across the schools was that the folks who were there were incredibly helpful, incredibly thought, thoughtful, and just really um, just uh, just helped move the, the, our thinking you know forward. Basically, now the work we've got five planning teams. Of staff taking input and identifying goals and initiatives and actions to take over the next three years. So they're taking all the input, they're taking the knowledge they have of the schools and district, you know, they're taking the input from our from the, the staff groups. Um, and they're looking at um, five different areas. Um, and we have had 38 folks across those five teams, plus all the principals doing it. Yeah. And so um, and that that's you know, the school, school secretaries involved, um, ESPs are involved, coaches, um, psychologists, counselors, and also teachers as well. So really good across all, all schools represented. Um, these are the planning teams. So you'll these will um, strike you as familiar. Um, better connecting general education, special education, strengthening mental health support and social emotional learning, um, strengthening the special education team processes. These are these are really come from the priorities that Katie Provo um, explained to you folks during the budget budget process. 
um, engaging students more deeply in learning. So that's the idea of moving students from dependent to independent learners off over the course of their career in school here. Um, and then the last one is deepening the connection between students, families, and schools. So how do we really uh, make sure that students want to come to school every day? Okay. Um, and uh, that last one I'm leading, and that's with our, our principals and leadership team are engaging in that. They're the sort of team that's, that's focusing on that. Um, and I had a great session with them uh, this morning. Um, so uh, what folks are working on, and so there, there are some key questions or sub areas in each of those. And then each team is using this template. Um, and you can see that, um, so what's they're gonna identify with the goal and future state in that area. What, what are we heading towards in that area? They always will identify what's already in place, okay? As I've mentioned again and again, we've got a strong foundation in these areas in our schools. We're not, we're not building from scratch. Um, key initiatives, those could be to continue. And most places will have initiatives we're continuing, okay? Um, we're doing some great things in a lot of these places. And some to start, we'll have measurements of success. And then I think probably the most, not the most important piece, but uh, actions for the next three years, okay? And really, really important that those actions we do not want a list of 15 actions in each area in each team, okay? That cannot be done reasonably. And I've mentioned this to you before, is we need to create a plan that's, that's achievable, that's clear, um, and actually you know, you know, helps drive us forward rather than overwhelming us or um, is easy to dismiss because it's, it's unrealistic. Um, so the idea is that, um, you know, it also is new actions every year. There, there are plenty of things that need, you know, a uh, number of years to work on, to work through. So that's the that's how we're organizing it. That's part of making so far. Okay. So that ties the budget because um, after we get that in place, we're we're using some of that in the budget process this year, but it really will be a very closely tied to the budget in the upcoming years. So to jump in here, um, as we said before, guiding principles for FY twenty three budget development are okay, the ongoing plan for ongoing improvement based on our priorities for student learning, student support, and high quality instruction. Moderation of financial prudence. Um, a really big piece for us this year, as all of you know, is improving recruitment and retention of staff, and that's um, in a variety of ways, including um, increasing our salaries, uh, and building a budget with an eye towards FY25 when federal relief funding ends. Okay. So those are some of the key areas here. This is in terms of the process. So we completed the yellow, we're on the green, and we have those ones below the green to go. Um, but what this speaks to is um, the many steps of the process, the collaborative nature of the process, beginning with our work with our uh, school district leaders, and then working with the committee, the subcommittee, uh, being a subcommittee, and now the full committee, and then you know moving towards the night is the next step in terms of you know including the public as well. Um, we do want to. Um, uh, anticipate a budget that allows for sustainable growth. And that um, always matters, and that matters when we're negotiating contracts, that matters when we're looking at ESSER funding, um, and what we have now, and what we don't have, won't have in a few years. Um, it's also about making sure that we're conscious of um, sort of uh, very typical increases in costs we can expect every year, I'll go to those in a moment. Um, and that, of course, all of that, um, we want to build budgets that support ongoing improvement students, student learning and construction and engagement. Um, we can't do that if we're lurching um, up, down, or sideways in our practice or in our budgets. So let me get to this financial section. So we're going to just go over a few of the, the key things that are the main drivers of changes in the budget. And really, one of the changes is increases. And um, when there are increases in these, it impacts what we can do in other areas. Um, and these are the places we anticipate and expect increases you know, typically every year. So I mentioned earlier uh, about salary adjustments to attract and retain staff. So uh, we had a sort of similar approach across our labor negotiations where it was trying to increase starting salaries um, and then also um, make adjustments where necessary. So you see this is for the uh, GTA and the teachers. Adjustments need to be made in, in athletic coaching um, and some stipends. Uh, we also wanted to prioritize increasing course reimbursements for areas of need, like in terms of special education and English language learners. Um, and then also wanted to um, make sure that folks could get a top, to a top salary um, in a reasonable amount of time as well. Similar um, in terms of operations support staff, we eliminated bottom steps and raised um, salaries significantly, particularly in areas like um, food service, 
um, paraprofessionals, um, our school secretaries at those areas. I um, wanted to make sure that we're competitive with our districts, uh, with our neighboring districts and our dark districts. <clears throat> so in terms of dollars, um, in terms of compensation, these are teacher compensation changes you see um, across the various areas. Typically, there's some retirement savings um, every year. So you, you see that included there. Um, that helps us balance the other increases um, uh, uh, a fair bit. Um, and that, that's because folks retire at a higher salary and re typically replace them with folks who are younger in their career and therefore have, have uh, salaries that are lower. Um, another area of, of change in the budget, and this is a, a, in addition, is we're taking our, some of our ESSER positions, as, as we described, in really three, four key areas um, and absorbing them onto the operating budget. <laughs> Typically, we'd be able, we could, in terms of these days, we could perhaps add some positions. We are not adding positions because they're here this year, but by op, um, putting them on the operating budget, we're making them um, you know, more permanent or more stable. And these are, um, I'll get them here, ones we talked about, and ones we're already seeing significant, um, you, know, really, you know, just the real, real improvements um, from these folks and the great work they're doing. Um, you heard from Amy Cam and how she's able to, in her leadership position to strengthen the support of our clinical staff, and especially uh, in this day and age, and I don't, and I don't mean just pandemic. You know, we're we're are, are many so many ways our world has changed, especially for our young kids, um, <clears throat> our students in terms of their needs and and their for um, social emotional learning skills, but also mental health support. So that's made a big improvement. And then also looking at some uh, our, our kids who are most in need, special education. Um, really having better coordination and support for our teachers at, at uh, the high school, but also improving coordination and support of, uh, of families and their students um, through better uh, leadership and really more capacity uh, in special education at the high school. Adjustment counselor um, uh, certainly O'Malley is a place that um, that is just um, that age, um, especially this day and age, uh, and age of social media and all sorts of things in the pandemic. Um, it's challenging. It's a, it's a, it's a turbulent, I haven't been a middle school teacher myself, it's a turbulent time. And um, certainly um, the new adjustment counselor at O'Malley has been helping um, sort of just, uh, well, it just helps every day in supporting those students and large, large of students. The transportation manager, um, as uh, we talked about before, uh, really such an important um, uh, role in terms of redundancy and support for our, our, our busing operation. Without that, the transportation director's job is um, they're out there on, on an island. And an island, with, when you think about one of the, you know, driving in our world is one of the most dangerous things we do, you know, and so to have safety and support and focus on training um, and really uh, really doing your great systems there um, has been a tremendous help. And, and you have a great team there now with a manager and a director. So those um, are sort of the, the biggest addition to the budget by absorbing those positions from ESSER to the operating, operating budget. Um, health insurance is always an area where things go up. And when you combine the employees and our retired employees, that's an increase of about 5.8% this year. Um, the tune of almost $400,000. Um, our after district tuition, another significant driver of increases in our costs. Um, we're having um, so, some adjustments there. Um, and actually, our average tuition budget this year, because of circuit breaker aid and our prepaid tuition offset, we actually will have reduced overall costs for next year. But that's because we're able to make investments this year, as well as having circuit breaker aid come, in, come in at a higher level. Um, even though the costs go up, um, the, the tuition goes up, the costs during FY23 are slightly lower. By ninety thousand um, dollars. So that's a. This is a summary of the significant adjustments. I've gone over most of them right now uh, already. This is sort of a summary table. Um, one thing you see here is uh, well, something we're shifting to ESSER, which is um, K to five math curriculum materials. So we're going through a. Um, as you remember, last year um, did the um, math and focus update and review. So those are sort of they're not one-time funds, but they're sort of limited funds. Um, uh, that we're uh, putting on ESSER uh, for next year, and also providing um, uh, instructional apps for these math as well. So, sort of um, 
uh, short term operational pieces, instructional pieces that could go in SRF for a short period of time. And then here's a budget by department. Um, it hasn't changed some from what you saw earlier. Um, some of the increases are due to staff increases, which are um, you know affect different schools just in terms of size of school or you know, you know who works there. Um, professional development, you see that's a that's a decrease of 27%, 27%. That's the dollars we shifted to ESSER for a year. Um, that's what that, that amounts to. Um, and then athletics, that increase there is due to remember, as I said earlier, uh, the increase in FX stipends. So that's and that all amounts to as we said, $1.35 million increase from last year in terms of our operating budget and 2.96% increase. There's the summary right there. And then here's our per pupil. We have our DART districts on here and also our local districts. Uh, continue to be in the middle of this, which I think is the right place to be. Um, above the state average by a little bit. Also, I think a good place to be. And then here's sort of historical um, numbers in terms of where we've been uh in terms of increases in the operating budget over the last uh eight years or so um you know comparable to fy16 um a little bit down fy1819 and then um some very comparable to what we've been you know, within within a tenth of a percentage point over the last four years so um so we'd like to be that's a consistent area of stable sustainable growth we believe this is what you'll be voting on tonight, which is, you know, really it's it's this same chart here. Okay, this actually has the language of the vote. Um, before we get to that, I just want to make a connection to some of the things we're continuing to work on. Because we have ESSER, um, we have you no, know, we have an ability to um, be a little more flexible with the budgeting right now. Okay, and, and, and the primary reason for that is. By moving those at four positions from ESSER to the operating budget has opened up some dollars, not only next year, but the year after. So it opens up dollars in ESSER, you know, for, um, in, you know, to total, basically. Um, the tune about $800,000 because it's FY23 and FY24. Um, so we have a little more flexibility as we, you know, go through the budget process of identifying some things that we may be able to do or need to do. And I just want to talk about a few of those um, now because they're sort of still a work, work in progress. This is uh, what I shared with the uh, building uh, and finance um, last week. So I mentioned about our priorities and our guiding principles. They're on top here. So the first two to look at are building a budget with an eye towards FY25 and then moderation of financial prudence. So this is really what I, what I just said about continuing to work through our various sources of funding, Chapter 70, funding from the state, um, various federal grants and state grants, some of which continue to come to us with additions because of federal relief funds. Um, so there's the ESSER funds, but then also the state got uh, additional funds, went to the State Department of Education, and they develop grants or add funding to grants that we already have access to. So that's another way we, our, our, our funding may vary or possibly increase some. Um, and so those are areas that we can we're still working on basically um, because they are changing in flux which is a little bit different than normal in fact you'll actually see some increases um, tonight in one of your grant approvals um, so in terms of what we're continuing to look at is how do we support the O'Malley sustainable improvement plan they are going to be uh, working or continue to work on can they make schedule changes to um, perhaps potentially lower class size um, or um, areas of um, their math curriculum or their curriculum that we can um, do either through operating budget or through ESSER, that sort of thing. Um, operation support at GHS, and that's so um, the principal can really continue to lead and deepen his leadership uh, on the state improvement plan, especially around the area of areas of instruction. Um, this continues the work we've done with Andy Cam's position and Lisa Williams' position, um, as so many folks have gotten up and said um, about um, just uh, the leadership of the high school and having further support there. Um, and that also ties into the, the CBT um, director program as well. Trying to build that team so it's more of a team instead of you know just you know, just a few a few people. And um, if we can do that this year, um, if we can if we can identify how to do this for next year, that really I think um, sort of completes 
some of the build out of having a really strong administrative team that um, sort of can, can run on all cylinders rather than um, relying on, on heroic efforts from a few people, um, which is really, I mean, it's happened because of the pandemic, but also, you know, it's built in structurally to some degree. So that's a work in progress. Um, and also something um, that we've been working on is uh, we talked about the ELA curriculum and again tonight, and what a big change. And really, next week, talking to all the teachers in, in uh, K to five who work on English language arts about that little significant change that's coming for them. So, we're thinking hard about how do we get um, support across the schools to make sure that's done well. You know, that's an organization that's working very closely with Greg um, because that is um, such a significant shift in the way folks. Um, you know, teach really. Um, it's, it's, it's built on the foundation we've been working on, but it's a real shift. And um, it's not something that, that we can afford, nor can our, our students afford for us to do poorly. What I mean by that, doing it poorly means we're not supporting our teachers you know, well in doing it. We're not giving them the time, we're not giving them instruction, we're not giving them the you know, uh, time to work together. We're just telling them to go do it. If we did that, it, it would go very, it just would be bad effort on our part and would go and make it much more difficult for them. So, um, and then uh, we talk about instructional technology, number of times, and how can uh, additional federal grants and or ESSER support that, those areas. So, um, and then a few of these are just, um, you know, EL, you need to look at EL support, um, uh, continue to look at nursing capacity at the high school. Uh, we, we will be um, continuing um, uh, the increased capacity point six here at the high school that we were able to increase this year, um, and then shifts to preschool that move us toward more inclusive practice and full day programs. So those are things that are in the works, and if we're able to do any of that through ESSER or other grants, um, we'll be some of the first folks to know. But tonight is really, I want to just give you that full picture. Tonight, though, it's just on the operating budget. Those first slides I showed you that you've seen before, um, that where we have accounted for some of the changes and the ups and downs. Um, and then this is uh, ultimately um, that, that budget. We also have that impact. Let me pause there. Thank you for your patience. And I'm happy to ask answer questions with Gary's support. Okay. Uh, I, was looking, I was looking over this, um, knowing that we're supposed to be in the new building for veterans combined with East Gloucester in fall 2003. Why are there separate lines? Both of those schools because it's not happening till fall 2020. Okay, yeah, so I mean, like that's 20, yeah, I mean, I see fiscal year 2023, so that doesn't start in the fall. Oh, I'm sorry, so you so, so the fiscal year for us begins July 1st, 2022, okay. it goes June 30th, yeah, okay, yeah, so, so it's not the calendar year, the our fiscal year again, sorry, is June 1st, sorry, July 1st, 2022. Fiscal year we're talking about here, fiscal year 2023, goes July 1st, 2022. To June 30th, 2023. Okay, okay. So it's six months and six months. And yeah, so it's really the school year. Follow up would be I'm hoping we'll save money by combining those schools. Uh, I hope so too. Yeah. Um, uh, typically, we won't see savings in the first year, um, but that's, that's something we're actively working on. Mm -hmm. We're working on the integration of those two schools in a variety of ways programmatically, looking at leadership, looking at uh, staffing, that sort of stuff. Um, bring together two different cultures and two, di uh, and two different staff, okay, who have worked in very different ways for many years, okay, um, and, and then obviously the budget is, is a piece of that as well. So yeah, that's ongoing work that we're already engaged in. Okay. So my question, I don't, I don't really want to go backwards, but this just came to my mind, and I don't know if it's a conversation for a meetup meeting as opposed to here, so if I ask a question and you can't answer it, I understand. Yeah. So I read in the paper the other day about how CADA um, was able to um, operate on good gas prices because they had negotiated a good contract. And I'm wondering, I, I just don't know the answer to this question, do the schools negotiate a contract for gas and heating and things like that? And if so, are we taking into account that the price is going to be possibly higher going into next year? I mean, you might not have the answer to that, but it just dawned on me that I know I don't have the answer to that. But yeah. Gary Frisch might. <laughs> and I'm looking at Gary when I say this, I <laughs> yeah. transformed to him. But I'm just curious: have those? Have you had any of those discussions? And do we have contracts 
Yeah, do like I said, your price. And you do have a contract, and uh, that is going to go up, uh, and we budgeted for we next year. I still remember having that conversation. Yeah, but we can uh, get into the details at the next BNF. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do we want to take care of the action now? From the BNF? From Oh, from that yeah, so, yeah. so, so, this, so this, just, just to help new, new members, um, you vote on, on these numbers, and then that's, that's what goes, that's what the public is essentially commenting on um, for their public hearing, which is scheduled for April 13th. April 13th. Thank you. Um, and then this budget is printed in the newspaper, and, um, and then also, I mean, obviously, the presentations that we've had are all available on our websites. And if we approve it tonight, it goes into the paper tomorrow. Is that it? No, March uh, March thirty first. Oh, March thirty first. Yeah. And we also put on display the budget book at the library, at the district office, and at city hall, as well as on our website. All the line items. Yep. Yeah. And can I just just following up since we're in a public forum? So is our public hearing happening at? I mean. What is the form of our public oh. hearing? Sure. The, the, the public ha hearing actually happens as part of a of this time a regular scheduled school school meeting. That's very common, um, but it'll be posted, uh, I think, separately. And um, and so uh, just the, form the format is: I'll give a, an abbreviated version of the presentation, um, and then then it's essentially what, what we think of as open communication, but it's on a specific on this topic. On topic. So we're not going to be at City Hall. Like we're doing. Just this. Yeah, it looks okay. for, uh, for all their intensive intensive purposes looks just like this. Okay. Yeah. But advertised differently and right. you know, and yeah. information spread more. Yeah, yeah. more yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um someone would like to make a motion. I just want to make sure that everyone is clear on the numbers that we're putting up. Can you yes. So things like YouTube. <laughs> So we, well, we're just voting on this, posting this. Is that what the motion is? Not the actual number? Because we usually we do, we put the number in. We do put the number in. Yeah. Right, we'll that number. Yeah. Um, so at our BNF meeting on March 16th, we reviewed everything that you saw tonight. And there was a motion that was presented and um, seconded to recommend to the full committee to approve the notice of public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2023 budget for publication in the amount of $46,988,897. And I shall move. Okay. Uh, discussion? No questions have confirmed what we have experienced that the process has brought everybody along in terms of details and uh, questions have been asked and answered along the way. Very okay. thorough presentations. Yeah, very thorough. Uh, Administration. Uh, Maria, can we have a roll call vote? Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Verda. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Weeson. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. And Mr. Minion. Yes. Okay. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank um, Gary Frisch and Cody Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Uh, every couple of days or every week or so, um, I have a small freak out. And uh, I talked to Gary. And I Okay, we're doing fine, um, but that's because they have such a good eye on things, and we understand um, the budget inside and out, and are um, great collaborators. Excuse me, Kevin. Yes. Do you or Ben want to just for the public, as they know, of the next steps? This is for publication, public hearing. Eventually, comes back to the committee. I guess I'm explaining it now. Okay. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. So, so we are now at the point where um, we are required to have a public hearing on our budget. So this is our process of having our public hearing. The city council does a similar um, piece in June, May or June. They have their public hearing on all their departmental budgets as well. So we're kind of ahead of them because we need to do our budget prior to submitting it over to the to the mayor's office. So. We'll do the public hearing. We'll take input from the public. Um, some people show up to say, you know, keep going, you're doing great, you support the budget. Other people may say, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? So, so there are opportunities on April 13th to bring that feedback or those comments or questions to us. 
Um, from there, we incorporate those comments um, into our thinking about the budget, right? We take that input. Um, in the meantime, also, as the superintendent is looking through those other things that are on his list of future things, those decisions may flesh out to make a change into the budget. We then um, incorporate, and, um, and so that goes through the BNF subcommittee. And if there are changes to that budget, we make those. And then we do another vote to vote the official budget to send over to the mayor's office. And, um, and so we submit to, to the mayor's office. Sometimes that budget just gets blessed and sent on to city council. Sometimes the numbers differ. Um, but we have made our case as to what we believe we need. And then it goes to the city council review as well. Take yeah, it just so people have an idea. So I'm going to be beginning. I think in the next couple of weeks, working with all the department heads in a pretty intense uh, way to so I can develop what goes into the city's by that, that will flow to the city council. I don't know if they publish their um, reviews, but it, they're going to have like day long reviews, uh, like eight hour sessions. So stay tuned for that. And eventually they'll call in you and know, Ben to talk about your budget, our budget. Uh, and then by the end of June, we vote a formal budget for the following fiscal year. After the city council votes, we then it then comes back and we vote it again so that it comes official. Which always ends up to be the Wednesday of Fiesta, when mm -hmm. Fiesta this year. So we're going to make that a quick meeting. <laughs> so right now it's going to be June 22nd. That's the first That's time. That's the Wednesday of Fiesta. Fiesta. That's the first time. <laughs> it's that way. That's usually the only time. Okay, too, right? Yeah. So that's Thursday. Thursday. Oh, that's Thursday. That's two years we have met Fiesta. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 ben might want to do that. He's a runner. Which one? Yeah. 5K. Yeah. You can do it with Matt. I'll run. Matt does it every year. Matt and I discuss running today. It's not going well for you. You're more of a track. I can rally. Okay. Wait, when's that race? Thursday. That's Thursday, yeah. yeah. So we can have an early meeting on, on the 22nd of June. All those dates are in the calendar which I showed you. Um, we have a budget central on the uh, on the you know budget operations part of the website, which we updated tomorrow with this presentation and all the other work we've done. And then the calendar's on there now. It's update, so. Are these dates going to be on the GPS calendar? Oh, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but we certainly could. Um, Gary, we help you remember that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think some of the you know some of the ones are sort of you know firm, um, but yeah, we can. I think it's a good idea. Where the public hearing should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe, um, yes, the entire be. calendar is a document you can search and find, but you're right on the face of our calendars. Right, because people okay. refer to our calendar to look for what. Okay. Um. And we'll move on to subcommittee reports. And we want to accept the superintendent's report. Oh, we want to make a motion to accept the superintendent's report. So we'll just. Okay. <laughs> Great job. Discussion. Okay. Maria, can we have a roll call vote? Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Perga? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yes. Jefferson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minio? Yes. All right, we will move on to subcommittee reports. And the first report is by Melissa Prince uh, from the Building and Finance Subcommittee meetings of March 15th and March 16th. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna continue right now with the, the meeting from the 16th, which was our BNF meeting, um, everything we've been discussing now just to stay on path. Um, and two of them, I'm not gonna give a report of that meeting because it was basically what we saw and discussed tonight. But out of that meeting, there was two, Two additional meeting, two additional motions, I believe. Um, so I'm just gonna, they're pretty self explanatory. I can also show those on the screen. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. So the first one is the resource officer. Yep, we get that. So as Ben's talk, um, putting that up there, um, as you know, we have a resource officer at the high school and one at O'Malley, and we do a cost share with the city. So um, it was motioned and second to recommend to the full committee to authorize the CFO to request a special budgetary transfer of $60,000 to the Gloucester Police Department for funding of the Gloucester High School Resource Officer for fiscal year 2022. And I so move. Second. So 
So are there any questions? So this is just a, it might help. Yeah, go ahead. This is a transfer. Um, and this been, has been happening since I think 2014. Yes, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, the we our budget we reimburse the city for for two things, and you talk about both of them tonight. One of them is the second resource officer. So um, the city pays a salary, then we reimburse the city for that cost. Okay, and, and that's what this motion is. And then I'll talk about the second one. And I just want a little bit of clarity because I think it's the O'Malley resource officer, right? It's, so I don't, I don't yeah. know that we should say the word Gloucester High School resource officer because I think it's the second one was the O'Malley one. It's the so I just don't want to link it to one and it be the other. Right. So I guess I would just amend the motion to remove GHS. Yeah, you, you, just say, you could just say a school resource officer. Yeah, school yeah. resource exactly. officer, exactly. Um, the BNF packet said it was GHS, the GHS school resource officer, so that's why I put it in there. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah, um, but I just wanted to make sure as this goes forward from all of us that we correct that just okay. to remove GHS so that it doesn't cause any confusion in case it's, which is what I think, which is O'Malley resource officer. Okay. So I guess I did do a motion to amend a motion to remove GHS. An amendment. So is there a second? Second. second. Okay, <laughs> shall we vote on the amendment? <laughs> Any discussion on the amendment? Yeah. Okay, Maria. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Verga? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Chair Preston Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minnie? Yes. Okay, so now we have the motion. Um, any discussion on that? No? Okay, Maria? Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Berger? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Reeson? Yes. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minio? Yes. Great. So the other motion, um, as Ben just um, announced too, it's, it was motioned and seconded by the BNF Committee to recommend to the full committee to authorize the CFO to request a special budgetary transfer of $420,452 for the out of district tuition expenses to be paid through the school choice program. And I so move. Second. Okay, um, discussion. And I just want to add that this, like Ben said, this is an annual reimbursement to the city. It happens every year, so it's not anything new. The and money goes to the cherry sheet, I believe. Right, and, and, and what this is, is that, uh, so we have students who, uh, from other districts, or I'm sorry, students for Gloucester residents, they choose to go to um, other districts. Okay, so choice out of out of Gloucester to a neighboring district, neighboring public school district. Um, during their time there, they are evaluated um, uh, as a special education student, and then need to go out of district to a private, uh, no, no, private or public placement outside that district for such education placement. So it's it's like you talk about our out of district tuition students. It's, it's the same thing, but they are going from that. Um, that neighboring district they've choiced into. Okay. Uh, the city gets charged for that and then we re reimburse the city for those for those costs. And those costs are up here. Um, you can see for the last four years and the different schools or public school districts that uh, that were um, essentially paying tuition to. Right. Um, this amounts to seven students across these one, two, three, four, five. Uh, districts or organizations that are um, that are involved in this support. And as we discussed this motion, the frustration um, that we've had for many years um, was discussed, and I think Bill brought it up, that we don't have a decision in these expenses. This is students that go to other districts, and those districts are making the decisions for their um, the programs that those kids are going into, and then they just build Gloucester. So... Yes. Um, until the law changes, which I know there was some discussion of it a few years back with Kustar, um, it still remains the same. So we're obligated for these expenses for a good cause. Okay. I'm just curious because I wasn't, I haven't seen this name before. What is the scene collaborative? It's it's like the North Shore Consortium, just in a, a different location with some different type, types of program. Okay, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's one of the regional you know, collaboratives that provide. A variety of different services, including special education services, to, to local districts. All right. Um, no more questions. Okay, we have both, please. 
Ms. Prince? Yes. Mayor Berger? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Reeson? Yes. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minnie? Yes. Um, and that was it for that meeting on the 16th. So I'm going to go back to the building finance subcommittee of March 15th, um, where we discussed the building use um, policy procedures and costs. Um, I sent you all an email, but I'm going to highlight through it um, just for the sake of the public knowing what we did at that meeting. So at our meeting, um, which was attended by um, myself, Kathy, and Ben through Zoom because they were going to the great hockey game. Bill and I stood stood behind to keep the conversation going. Um, we met with Mark Cole, who is the Assistant Director of Budget and Administration from the Department of Public Works to discuss the policies and the procedures. And we, we learned a lot. It was a good conversation, um, very informative. Um, first, we learned from Maria that um, we have these books of all the rentals that we've done for the past couple of years, which is, is a great resource. Um, as you know, the past two years with COVID, we probably haven't rented um, our facilities as much, um, but we do have those documents to review and get an idea um, for discussions going forward of what our actual building use used to look like and it will probably look like um, hopefully coming back this year. Um, the first topic we discussed was um, it, the finances and how it worked. And um, it was no surprise to learn that um, the account that collects the building fees is on the city side, it's not the school side. Um, and I believe the city auditor, Penny Costa, um, manages that account. Um, the schools receive no money from building rentals. The money is deposited into that account, and that account then funds um, costs for like utilities, repairs, maintenance, custodial fees, and supplies. So just to be clear, the schools do not benefit from any rentals other than the joy and the pleasure of being able to give back to our community by using our buildings. Um, the biggest expense for the building use is our custodial fees, and we, um, we have their contract and know what those salaries are as they go up each year. We had a conversation about utilities, the cost of heat and um, other lighting and stuff like that. And because I was curious to know if those costs were figured into what we charge and we learned that they're not. Um, Mark Cole did said he's gonna look into some uh, industry standards to find out in case that is gonna be part of our conversation going forward um, when we talk about costs. We learned that the heat um, during the cold weather months is turned down on the weekend, so we're not heating our buildings consistently um, through the winter. West Harris, I think, is the one school that is on a system because it's a newer school, and I'm sure our new school will be the same when we have veterans East Gloucester School. But the custodians usually turn the heat down on Fridays and then go in on Monday morning early and turn the heat back up. Um, I, I asked about shoveling and snow conditions, wondering if during storms, if there's rentals, do we have to pay extra for the custodians to come out and shovel at a time when they normally wouldn't? And we learned that the city gets charged for the removal of snow by the inch of each storm. So it really doesn't matter how many times they shovel because they would be doing the work anyway. So for anyone renting the property, it, it was learned that we, do not have any expenses that are related to snowing and um, shoveling and plowing. Because um, as you know, the custodians are responsible for doing the work of shoveling the um, pathways. Um, we also learned that our rental fees are pretty much outdated. We looked at, um, or Gary did some work um, looking at about five, di five different districts and I pulled out some districts as well. And um, our costs are just, um, not really comparable to other school districts, either in our dark communities, because we look there, and also our surrounding school districts, so we need to um, look at that. We also learned that costs for wear and tear are not considered when we rent space. Um, in regard to the custodians, um, as you know, we can't rent buildings without having a custodian in the building, so that's a requirement. Um, some schools, like this school that we're in now, do have custodians working during the night. So if there was a rental here, the custodians are already here, so there's not um, an extra charge for that. Um, there are no set regulations or standards or processes in place to determine how many custodians are required for a rental. So in other words, if there was 500 people, there's nothing that indicates right now um, how many custodians would be needed for that amount of people. Is it one? Is it two? Do they look at what type of function is? Those type of conversations um, have not happened. So there's nothing in place at this time. 
Um, custodians are not required to work on weekends. Um, if they do work, they get time and a half on Saturdays and double time on Sundays and holidays. Um, our custodians are not staffed on the weekends. So we have to, um, when we look at our costs, we have to take that into consideration when we tell the renter that um, they have to pay for custodians, we have to be sure that we inform them that the costs are higher on the weekends. Um, the DPW made it clear that the custodians are not responsible for supervising our rented spaces. They're not babysitters. They're there in the building to set up, clean up, and if anybody needs anything during those rentals, sorry, I feel like I've got a student. They're there to address um, the needs of that, um, of that group. Um, when there is a rental, the way the process works is um, the DPW puts out some sort of announcement. I don't know how they do it, maybe through email, that there's a job available. And then it becomes like a bid. Uh, custodians can um, react to if they want to work, let them know, let whoever's managing the rental know. Um, the head custodians get a first priority and it goes by seniority. Um, so therefore, the most expensive custodians mm. get the first um, bite of the apple per se when um, rentals are available. Um, if for some reason nobody puts in for the job, there is a mechanism to. Um, put some pressure, as I would put it, um, on the least seniority custodian to come into the building, even though they're technically not required to work. Um, a supervisor to, uh, to a custodian is always available. In other words, if you have a junior custodian, there's someone available by phone in case that custodian has a question. So they wouldn't necessarily be in the building, but there's always availability to discuss an issue if needed. Um, we learned that the summer days are the busiest for our custodians. Um, as they maintain, repair, and prepare our schools for the opening in September. I was talking to them tonight before I came in here, and they were telling me how they strip the floors, they have to remove the furniture out of all the rooms, but that is their busiest time um, working in the schools as opposed to during the school year. In regard to rental applications, um, we learned that um, we have never, the school district has never had really a long-term um, rental. The only one I can think of is our after school program by the YMCA that we've been doing for the past couple of years. I know that used to be our program and we weren't able to manage it, so we brought in the YMCA to help us. So that's probably the, the most consistent, longest term rental that we have in our classes, in our schools. Classrooms are not typically rented. Um, I think Maria, who is the building use coordinator, we, we gave her a new title because she, she's involved in all these rentals. Um, so just so you know, you can add that to her job description and her, and her salary over there. Um, she did recall a long time ago, there was a classroom that was rented for a computer class um, for one day. Um, but other than that, there doesn't appear to be a history at this time uh, for renting that classrooms. And that's something I want to dig into when I look at these books. Um, that we have stashed away for the past years. Um, just trying to bring through this. Um, classrooms are being utilized by staff over the summer. Um, we do have school summer school. We learned tonight that the Lost Red Foundation has programs in our schools during the summer. So our classrooms are used for student-based um, interest over the summer. Um, the DPW, and Mark Cole did state that it would be easier for the DPW staff not to have summer rentals, which in turn would allow their staff full access to the buildings to prepare for school openings in the fall. So not only are they doing cleaning, but if there's any repairs that needs to be done to the building, um, if they have to re repair HVAC or, or a floor or whatever, they do it over the summertime. So they would like to be able to have free access to the building um, of course, while they're managing around our summer school programs, which is pretty active. Um, I, we got into a conversation about quotas and it, um, learned that we do not, at this time, have quotas for each, for capacity of each room. Like in other words, how many, how many students can fit into the West Parish Auditorium? Um, we don't know that answer. Um, parking spaces, I asked Mark Cole if he could get us some um, information on parking spaces, and I'll give an example. Plum Cove only has 25 spaces, Beeman has 38 spaces, O'Malley obviously has a lot more, 400, High School has a lot more, West Parish has 77. So that's something to think about when we say we're going to allow a rental for a large group, okay, where are they parking? Even though there's spaces 
designated lines. Of course, we know there's ways to make other spaces. However, there is a concern for grass getting ruined. We don't want neighbors complaining. We don't want driveways blocked, um, things like that. So we'll be talking about um, quotas and we can you know, get a lot of that information from the fire department um, as we make those decisions so that we know we do have the capacity when we say, yes, we're gonna rent. Um, rentals that include playgrounds use are approved by the school. However, rentals that use the field are not approved by the school and approved by the DPW only. Um, as far as the procedure, we learned the principal of each school is the first person to sign off on the rental request. Um, it's unclear what that actual process is, but I'm sure we'll learn more as we have these conversations. Uh, Maria informed us that the school secretary emails the approved documents to her. She checks the calendar and then there's a conversation with Gary. Um, and then that process starts talking with the DPW. Um, Matt Cole made it clear that the DPW is not an approver of the rental request. It is on the school side. So we're actually the decision maker. And then um, we tell them that it's approved and then they try to figure out how to get a custodian, if they can get a custodian um, and so forth. Um, it was reported that there's minimal discussions, upfront discussions that we hope we can improve that communication in the process going forward. Um, unlike other communities at this time, the school committee is not involved in any decision-making with rentals. However, we've learned through many other policies that school committee does make decisions on some types of rentals. Usually those rentals involve non-community based rentals, longer term rentals. Um, some communities have a, a group that forms that involves like the superintendent, the DPW director, another city person that get together to discuss and approve long-term rentals so that all the department heads are talking to each other and they make a decision going forward. And then in other districts, the school committee gets involved in that level once all the um, dynamics have been worked out. So um, we are going to have another meeting on April 11th. Um, we confirmed that today, it's a Monday. Um, ben did a, a good job on um, giving us a list of topics to discuss when we go into that meeting, um, to discuss um, the application, an application fee like they have in some districts, um, the, the actual process, how that will work from beginning to end to start, the re from request to final approval, the priority of uses, um, we're going to talk about things like having liability insurance. I don't know that we do that now. It's recommended not required. Recommended required. It's, um, it's recommended now. It's not required. It's not required. In some places, some districts require. Yeah, and I can tell you from being on the licensing board, we require um, liability insurance for all um, events, which is very easy to get. It's not something you sound like when you tell someone they have to go get liability insurance at first. They like, oh, how do I do that? You know, it's a very simple process. Um, and that way we would have insurance coverage for any damage or um, issues that happen so that the city's not liable for the cost, neither is the individual. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised about the liability. There's a I know. Box on the I form. know. There's a lot of things to be surprised no, about. There's a checkbox on the form, so one would assume. Mm -hmm. So we're saying because it's not spelled out on the policy, yet it's on the form, it's not a requirement. So I, that's a pretty great I would say that the process, and, and this is just from where we're at right now, being new, is it, it needs to be developed more and yes. it, needs, it needs more attention, right? right. So we, we, we learned a lot from this conversation, a lot. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna have a good discussion um, and there's lots of room for improvement, right? But knowing that we haven't had a lot of rentals, this, this really hasn't triggered no, yeah, this I, type I, I of thing. But now it has, right? I agree. I mean, it was like 20 years ago we did a policy, and now here we are 20 years later. Uh, were there it's obvious um, maybe omissions or things yeah. that weren't clear that it's time to review? Uh, one thing I would ask you to, to yeah. think part of the discussion is um, because we've, we've had a lot of experience with snow in the last few weeks. With what? With snow. Snow. So, because so, typically, like, we've been lucky that it's been snow, like, on a Friday, so we have the whole weekend to clear. Yeah. But if somebody's got something booked for a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, yeah, it, there's going to be some disclaimers that say, you know, the DPW is not going to rush to get there first, yep. you know, to make, so we're going to have these outs that are in there. I would say that there's a couple of disclaimers that have to go on there that yeah, we, yeah. we need to discuss, and, and not only that, but who's going to tell who, when things happen, you know, so there, there's a lot of mechanics that need to be worked out. And we really haven't had a reason to, to review this because a majority, I would say from what I've heard from Maria and just being here for the past few years is a majority of our rentals are like PTO. 
Yeah. Um, sports groups, the um, Little League, you know, or um, Bill Melvin's involved with one, the, um, what is the, the one uh, of the sports teams? Travel basketball. Travel basketball. So the rentals that we've been doing, majority of them are student-based, you know, even if it's not a Gloucester school program, they're still student-based. Yeah. They're community-based. And it's, it's either a one-day rental or it's a one-season rental that happens regularly, you know, that happens in most schools, right? So now we're getting interest from other groups, which is forcing us to like, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here, you know? So this is going to be an in-depth look at what our policy is. Is it best practice? And we have plenty of policies to look at. You know, are the costs current? I'm going to say no. Um, are all our concerns addressed? I would say no. You know, you want the liability insurance. You want to make sure that there's good communication between the DPW and the school before the approval is made to say, yes, there is a custodian available, not okay, we're approving it, find a custodian, you know, so those conversations, upfront conversations, I think should be worked into what we're doing. Um, the, the fact that the schools get nothing for the rentals and the money goes on the city side, which is okay, because you pay in your, your fix and repairs and things like that, you know, where is the priority in the rentals? You know, if you have two groups that want to use the new school gym at the same time, we're going to have this beautiful basketball court, right? So if you have two groups that want it at the same time, how are we going to prioritize that? Our policy doesn't address that. Many other districts do tiers. In other words, if you're a community member, if you're a student-based member, if you're a school, um, school access, you get first priority. You know, those are the kind of things we have to work out so that we don't get ourselves into a jam going forward. We are building beautiful schools. We're maintaining beautiful schools. We have labs. We have vocational programs. There's going to be interest in using that space. The question is, how do we make sure that it stays safe, it, that the people are safe, you know, the school is safe, the school, the school community is safe from that, you know, do you need security guards? We don't have that conversation here. They do in Cambridge, you know, so there's just, I don't want to take up all the time here, but there's just a lot of work to be done. Um, I would suggest, knowing that we're meeting on April letter, that anyone does have anything they want discussed by our group to either email me or Bill or Kathy, and we can incorporate that, those conversations into our conversations so that when we come back here to this group with recommendations, it'll, it'll address the concerns you have as opposed to dealing with them afterwards. Um, because I think there's a lot of work to be done here. I think we're eager to do the work, get it done get a great policy procedure and costs out there, have a good relationship between DPW and the schools and come out in a, in a good way. You know, we, we know what our, um, we know what our responsibilities are to whoever requests a rental. Like you can't refuse a rental based on who they are because that seems to be the topic of the conversation lately through the emails that we're getting. So we know where we stand legally with that, but how we do rentals clearly needs to be addressed um, for, all, for all parties, DPW, the renter, the schools, the school committee, feel secure that we're doing the right thing by opening our doors to the public, knowing we're getting nothing for doing it. And I just can't express that nothing because I was just surprised by it. You know, it's, it just makes you look at what is the benefits here. You know, so it's it's the feeling good of knowing taxpayers of Gloucester are paying for our buildings. How do we keep them in a good way, but share what we have at the same time with our community? When we originally adopted it, we did get, we the school department got the money because as you know, because you're on the school Custodians, when you yeah. flipped it to the city side. But um, yeah, so twenty years, it's time for a, a page one rewrite. Yeah. Um, and I do have some, I, I don't need to bring it up tonight, but I, there's going to be some legal questions that come up out of that too. And I would just hope that um, through our discussion, we can do Ben or whatever, reach out to Naomi and Greg and just get some legal questions asked too as we come forward with a more robust policy that has good language in it that can try to have the foreseeable future to know all the issues that could come at us. Um, like I said, especially knowing that we're going to have new school buildings. I mean, West Parish is beautiful. This new school, I, I ride by it every day, is going to be gorgeous. You know, people are hearing about great things, labs that are going on at O'Million here, the vocational program. We have a grant for that tonight, which is like a build and rental. 
there's going to be people in our schools. We're just going to make sure that we do it right. So, um, and that was my report. Um, stop it. Okay. Um, next, we have program subcommittee with Laura Wieson. Yes. So we um, we met on March 17th uh, for our second meeting with Attendance Works. Um, so in attendance was our program subcommittee, Greg, Amy Cann, and our two um, uh, erstwhile Attendance Works uh, um, researchers and helpers. Um, so this meeting um, was really for, for them to um, get us up to date on the new DESE guidelines related to attendance and then start to give us their recommendations. So it, there's a lot of, there's a lot there. Um, I will go through, I know this was sent to everyone, but I want the public to know about this. Again, we started with the fact that chronic absence is 10%, um, missing 10% of your days of school. So 18 days for any reason. And this um, is critical because throughout these recommendations, there is a, it, this is not truancy. This is excused absences are counted as part of chronic absenteeism. Um, and you'll see throughout these recommendations that um, there's really a move both by DESE and recommended by attendance, attendance works to move away from punitive punishment for missing school and how to engage and bring uh, students and families back into the school. So I'll just go through um, the number one, the first recommendation was to utilize DESE reporting guidance to define presence and absence. So that's just how much school you have to be present for for that to be counted as a day. Um, secondly is to use the definition for chronic absence, which is uh, 18 school days, 10% you know, of the school days. Recommendation three, um, they described a tiered system of supports uh, and interventions for attendance, similar to what we do for tier one, tier two, so tier, two, three, tier three for um, academic work. So that's starting with a foundational whole school support and then sort of, you know, following, following, um, following up as students miss school. Recommendation four was to revive, revive the absentee notification process to support early intervention and personalized outreach. So this, um, this is complicated. This is about um, students and families really um, being contacted by an, a person, right? Not a robo call um, early in the process and start building relationships around this. And it's, you know, all of this is more complicated. And you'll tell me, Greg, if I'm missing some major thing, but it's, this is very much a summary. Um, this whole process is about engaging and creating relationships. So this is a place for that. Um, um, and part of this is letting families know that even excused absences count. And not only do they count, they, they, um, there's data that shows that the more, the more school you miss, the worse your outcomes are. And that's part of how we're gonna, um, how they want to share this information with families. Recommendation number five is including the roles and responsibilities of district and school level teams. So again, um, having sort of organized teams in the schools who are based on attendance, not just um, not just sort of one person whose job is attendance. Recommendation number six, de-emphasize punitive sanctions for truancy. Um, and again, this is the theme of much of this um, is how to engage and encourage kids to go to school and not to sort of lead to a punishment and a sense of hopelessness around school. Um, recommendation seven, um, which requires a lot more conversation at our next meeting, is um, eliminating the attendance failure policy. So um, currently at GHS, if you, miss, if you miss a certain number of days, you fail that class, regardless of what your schoolwork says. Um, and I, I felt attendance works makes a very powerful case as to why that doesn't lead kids to re-engage, but instead to just drop out. Um, recommendation eight was to adopt DESE dropout guidance. Um, and among other things that I, I thought was really interesting was that um, to really have an exit interview with students, really understand what's happening for them and to try, and, and the goal is really to try to re-engage or to offer other paths and not just to like remove kids from the system when they decide to drop out. I know that's a fine, but 
no, it's a great summary. I just want to point out on number seven that um, over the last year and a half, or almost two years, the attendance failure has been modified for COVID. And so students are not, that's not, a, not applicable during the pandemic, but it was prior and the discussion about whether it will continue. So can I just, <clears throat> something that I would like to know more about is, you know, we as a district, and I think sort of as a culture are sort of moving towards staying home more when we are sick, right? And so it, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily in a pandemic, but I think parents are keeping kids home for things that they might not necessarily kept them home for in the past. Um, and so, you know, how does that sort of translate as we sort of move forward um, post pandemic? Um, I mean, I know my, my daughter missed five days of school because of the pot, because I don't want to send her to school with a pot. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's, I think there's. The, I, I think it's very important to keep in mind that, that it takes a lot of days to get to chronic, which is 18 in a year. Yeah. So if you are going to be um, exercising that caution as a parent, which is totally understandable, um, I think the message is that you can't also take days to go to yeah. Disney World. You can't take days to go here or there. Like some something has to give. You can't do it all. Um, sure. But eighteen is a lot of days, um, and we have a lot, a lot of students yeah. who miss more than eighteen days. So that, in my opinion, goes far beyond missing five to eight days a year for uh, for health reasons, sure. which we might not have done previously. Sure. But there's a, there's a pretty big allowance for those kinds of things. And we're far, far exceeding any kind of reasonable uh, cautionary health uh, attendance. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. So I remember having this conversation when we created this policy years ago, because I remember being frustrated by the whole thing. Um, Mass General Laws states that kids can miss seven days in a six month period. So that probably amounts to about 10 days for a school year. Um, otherwise, there's consequences. I believe there's like a $25 fine. But my question is so, I, we, is attendance work suggesting that we go with 18 days? And if because uh, that's what I'm hearing, that 18 days. And if so, how does that work with the child requiring assistance, truancy um, regulations that are there as well, where you have to report to the court if a child is truant for missing so many days, what guidelines are they going to go by? So not that I'm against, I'm, I'm in favor of hearing about this non-punishment. That's where I want to go. That's where I wanted to go years ago. Um, but I'm just wondering how does that conflict with the laws and requirements that we currently have? Was that discussed or not yet? Well, I mean, this DESE just came out with new guidance. So, like, this is March 2022 guidance, but they're now. My sense was that their guide, their new guidance, really meshed with Attendance Works research and the data. I mean, I, you know, I don't know, but they're presenting stuff to us that's from that. I'm looking at some of this where they are talking about Massachusetts law and requirements, but I don't know about this seven day. Do they, they want to change it or? No, I think it's important to understand that um, it will be in, uh, in compliance with all uh, legal requirements. The chronic absenteeism, it's really important to understand that, um, that there's no mass general law around chronic absenteeism uh, per se. That's Desi. DESE calculates um, the impact of absenteeism and uses chronic absenteeism as a um, as a, 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 an accountability standard. So we are um, we are measured by uh, our our levels of chronic absenteeism, which is the ten percent of the school year. And we also, uh, I've shared this before, but that chronic absenteeism, of course, 
has a, uh, I think, a, a pretty strong impact on performance as well. So it's a, it's a double hit. So if somebody's out a lot, they might have lower scores. And then we also get dinged for the actual absenteeism rate itself. So the chronic absenteeism is unrelated to Mass General Law and those dates. Those don't disappear. We still have to provide the notice. We still have to do the um, appropriate CRAs. But what we're talking about is um, really identifying the impact of the number of days missed. And I believe the Mass General Law, unless I'm mistaken, there's about it's um, has a language around consecutive days too. I think um, I don't not sure it's a, a total like that. You may be right, but um, we're really focusing on the impact of the, the chronic absenteeism. First of all, if you get through your talk, you don't know some more talking points. Most of it, uh, most of it. I mean, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I just was thinking that uh, I saw it as when we discuss chronic absenteeism, I almost started as this is the definition. You know, this is kind of how we're defining it and saying, well, there's no laws around that, but here's the number. And uh, that's the that's the target. Anything above that, you're in trouble. So, um, and, and the other thing that I think is important to remember is uh, that we talked about a little bit was um, the messaging, you know, the messaging coming from schools and from the community about absenteeism, I thought was really important. And also uh, just the data behind that. And can we, uh, oh, I know what it was, taking baby steps with, your, with this process. It's such a large problem, not only in Boston, but nationwide that we don't need we don't need to hit ten targets up in the sky right off the bat. If we hit one target over the next couple of years, the next year, whether that be looking at it at the kindergarten level or whatever we decide is the right way to go about that, then um, that's at least a step in the right direction. I think. I think the idea, the problem is people get like all worked up about it. Oh, you know, this is, this is huge. How are we going to tackle this? Well, if we take it just a small step at a time, I think. I think we'll be in pretty good shape. Um, I, I thank you for, for mentioning that. One for the, the great overview, but also that key point, because uh, I think I shared the other night that um, it feels overwhelming to me until I think about where can we concentrate our, our efforts uh, at the, the, in a group that is gonna have a lot of change, make a lot of change. And I think uh, kindergarten, it, I think that's the spot because early habits are often lasting habits. And those are habits that our students um, need to um, demonstrate, but also those are habits that our families need to um, learn and practice. And I think that just goes together and carry them well throughout the, their years. So I, I would love to see us concentrate on manageable and also phase in, you know, we want to get here in five years. We're starting with these changes. Too many changes to the system. We've also got to break down. So the last thing, this is just relevant to the top, just because we don't have a next meeting scheduled. Um, I saw your email. So it looks like it won't be till May, right? Because that's last week in April yeah. that we tried to do it. So um, there, we, we do have a little bit of a time crunch. Yep. Because um, the goal is to have a meeting, adopt policy, or vote on policy, and then of course bring policy here. And and uh, anyway, so just to identify, yeah. there's yeah. a little bit of a time crunch. So I'm curious, and Shane might not be tonight, but to hear how. Um, of course, I can't tell how happy I am to hear this conversation because I remember how frustrated I was when we were talking about the punishment before. I mean. In the years we've been on the committee, we've gone, we talked about the, I hate even bring this up, but the punishment of kids not paying for their lunch and eating a different lunch and how we've morphed into a much better um, system that that is not punishable. And, and this attendance, I think, is another one where we have a lot of work to do because we were talking about, you know, kids can't play sports, they can't do this, they can't do that if they're not attending school. And while I can understand that you want to hold somebody accountable and, and get set that bar at the same time for the kid 
that is not coming to school, I've learned personally that they're they're not engaged and they they don't feel a reason to come to school. So how do we get them here? And punishing them only confirms them staying home. We can't get them to school if they're going to be punished for it. But at the same time, you got to hold them accountable. But I'm very interested to hear on how we can morph into a system that, in, that makes the kids want to come back. So, okay, we recognize that you've been out four days because you, no matter how hard your mother tries, you're not going to school. But what is the school doing to say, come back here? Let me let me help you come back as opposed to saying, well, when you come back, you're not playing your, your basketball and you're not going to recess or whatever they do for punishment. So I can't wait to see that sort of transition because I learned from experience that I think that's going to make a huge difference, especially at the um, O'Malley school level and the high school level. There's um, <clears throat> talk about uh, recommending um, specific uh, um, employees of the school system, be it a, uh, like a, like a close teacher to the individual student or even a, like a janitor or maybe a coach or something, someone with a personal connection to try to like, you know, bridge that gap and, and maybe even make a home visit. Um, so that was one of the suggestions they had. You know, rather than a you know, punitive thing, okay. try to do an outreach and some connection kind of thing. So I listened in on the meeting and I found um, the whole direction, the whole approach from the consultants and, and everything. I mean, I know our attendance policy when we were discussing it the last time was rooted in the fact that kids need to be in school to learn, right. right? We want kids in school. We want them to know it's important to be there to learn. Unfortunately, our policy did not necessarily, um, well, it didn't, it wasn't all about the positive things. I do think the messaging to families about being tardy and about being absent, at least at the elementary school, was very much the kids need to be there to learn. Um, but in terms of the supports to, to draw them back in, was not necessarily you know, in place and is probably not in place um, very much right now. <clears throat> so, and I know with, with the current policy, it's excused versus unexcused and people are freaked about one versus the other. And I like that this focuses totally on presence, mm -hmm. not on why you were out. Um, I know years ago we talked about families missing MCATs because they were on vacation, right? And we're like, oh my God, they took a second vacation this year and it kills the attendance. No, we want to talk about being present to learn. So I think um, I think even that's probably why it's an accountability thing from DESE is they want to know that <clears throat> our schools are engaging and that our kids are supported. And one of those pieces of evidence is how many kids, you know, have yeah. you know, regular good attendance. So I'm excited about yeah, there's about a lot. the whole it's reframing similar. of this. So are we worried about um, <clears throat> the timing of the policy to get into the handbooks and stuff like that? Well, they, Greg, again, correct me, but my understanding is you want to start training people and like get in the handbooks and start training, you know, staff to enact whatever our and, policy is. Yeah, the beginning. I think we need to be mindful that we are still in um, a, a pandemic and that we can't just plan on turning the switch yeah, and right. doing everything next year. So I think, first of all, there's the late, the, the, the lateness and the policy piece, but we, that's, that's about getting them into the handbooks. It is unlikely that this is going to be ready by the time the handbooks come up for approval. And it may be something that has to be, uh, you know, looked at at a, at a later meeting as a single item. Um, since we don't go to printing press anymore for handbooks, that's something that um, is more doable to, to add in during the summer. Um, and in the meantime, I, we're still in COVID relaxing mode still because yeah. they haven't declared the pandemic right. over. Right. I um, didn't know that the COVID was relaxing. I think I'm very relaxing for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are some pieces that we are going to want to identify to put in place. And I see one of those. Um, that is it, very actionable is you know, starting with incoming kindergarten um, uh, parents and students because that doesn't get as tangled up in the uh, course credit credit failure course you know uh, attendance failure I mean these are there are things that we can do without you know uh, getting caught up in some of the heavier duty. 
pieces that are at, at the higher grades. So we can get started. Um, yeah. But what's happening this year? Like, so we have that failing a class if you miss so much at the high school. Is that happening now? Are we or are we relaxed in the way we're no, coming that, that, That's been kind of relaxed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, the only other thing I want to point out is there the the connecting to students, the positive supports, those kinds of things are happening in, oh, yeah. in all of our schools with a lot of our staff. And so I, I don't want to give the impression that we are not doing a lot of the things. What we are what have not done is we haven't outlined it as policy. We haven't been intentional about saying, this is what we're going to do all the time. We want you to know it, and we want to have it be on the on the sort of front page. And we we still do that, a lot of this work. So a lot, of, you know, a lot of it is about you know putting it on paper and 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 living by it all the time. But there's a lot of great work happening for sure, and, and, and all the time with every student, all the time with every student, because it, it, you know every student and, and every family, you know. And that's when we have uh, chronic abstinence rates at this level. It isn't every student. And it needs, and, and people need to know, everybody needs to know that, that the types of connections that students benefit from, all students benefit from those connections. Um, and we have to make um, a concerted effort to make sure that um, every student can find a real connection to the school. So they, they have a reason to come every day. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, that's fair to say, you know, again, it's, it's trying to be honest, you know, not, 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 um, not, not negative. That doesn't happen very soon. We understand it. So we're, you know, with your support, make, we need to make a real effort to make sure that, that everybody knows that. We have to have it. And through our budget. That's huge. And I will say, um, I think, Thrilled by the Cata bus that has the everyday matters <laughs> thing on the side. And um, I think the more, you know, I know we've talked that school being valuable and what the community really values for our kids, the more it's a community message, you know, it'd be kind of cool to have across Rogers Street, you know, um, for a month in September. Um, so things like that, because I know you can get approval to put one of those big banners by the <laughs> swear. Um, but you know, those are ways to kind of elevate the messaging. Like, we're excited. Please, yeah, our schools are good. good. Please come to school. We want you at school. Um, and we have a great opportunity now because I think everyone missed. I mean, like, you know, for all of us who, when there wasn't school, I think the importance of school became that much more obvious for everything, for relationships and for socializing and for, you know, just all of that. I think we're at this moment where people really know that deeply in a way that they didn't when we were all in school every day. Guys, so just as we're sort of thinking of like how to spread the message, and I know that conversation will continue, but um, thinking about starting in kindergarten, right? Like I, sometimes I think our best messengers are our students, right? And so if like we have, if we have our students sort of talk to or do a video to our kindergartners saying like, this is what happens when you miss school. This is what you'll miss. You know, I, I know when my daughter misses school, she's like, I'm gonna miss this, and then I'm gonna miss this, and then I'm gonna miss this. And then I'm gonna, you know, there's like a list of things that she's gonna miss. Um, and so that to me would be really powerful, I think, is to have our students really stand up and say like, it's fun to be here and, you know, come to school because if you don't, you'll miss all these wonderful things. See Matt Fusco video. Yeah, I'm lining up all the videos. We're actually working, <laughs> all that, we're, we're working on all our school videos, yeah. 1623. So. I see a sign but, on but just... car. <laughs> <laughs> on all of our cars. <laughs> on City Hall. <laughs> and <Anyway, laughs> Bridget. Excellent report. Yes. Excellent work. Very important work. Yes. And Greg, thank you for <clears throat> yeah, tackling this. I know it's yeah, been thank, you. thank you to Amy Cam, who's yes. out there. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. We have <coughs> to continue. We the next item. Um, so we've dealt with two of the three of the action items. So um, the next is acceptance of grants, and we have um, 
6. Department of Elementary and Secondary Education grants. They all seem to be adjustments. They're minor adjustments. Minor yeah. adjustments. So without objection, do we want to have a motion to take these all together? Yes. Okay, so we want to make the motion to accept the grants. So we'll move. Second. Okay. Um, and we all have them in our packet. The public can see them in our, in our um, agenda. So Maria, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Berger. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yeah. Jefferson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. And Mr. Minion. Yes. And the next grant is the Essex County Community Foundation grant to Gloucester High School in the amount of $61,217.91. So moved. Second. Someone wants to probably give a little more mm -hmm. detail on that. Sure, this is the second second year, right, of the event of, of us working with the North Shore Workforce Development um, and, and, and Support of Essex Community to do um, uh, workforce training on advanced manufacturing with adults during the summertime. Um, so it's a big success last year. Um, uh, it's something that's supported by the Mass Hire. It's also been supported by um, the Mayor's Office both last year and this year. Um, it, uh, I think went very well last year. Um, one uh, apropos to that conversation, I checked in with um, Principal Cook today, uh, and this is being done. It's done during um, the summertime uh, from June until August, uh, done during the regular uh, hours of the building when their custodians on uh, already here and off the front working. So we're not hiring any of the folks, but there will be staffing here and that sort of thing. They use the advanced manufacturing um, uh, facility and then the classroom that's joining it. And that, and that's, so that's, all the, that's all the space they use. Um, and uh, we're just really pleased to um, be able to partner with organizations, support adults in you know, training or retraining them, um, and then uh, by, by doing that, be uh, a good team member. I don't really remember, but I can only assume that it was updated for the half a million dollar grant not that long ago, that whole yeah. facility. So I would assume that grant probably had a little eye towards adult education and maximizing that equipment. No. I, I assume I, I wasn't aware, but I, I would certainly make a lot of sense and that was not even done without this form. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? More questions? Okay. Maria, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Virgo. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Reeson. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. And Mr. Minia. Yes. Um, the next item of action is approval um, to continue inter-district school choice policy uh, file JFBB. Uh, just preferences every year. If you choose not to accept students from other districts, you have to vote to do so. Um, absent a vote, it's assumed that you are accepting kids, but we have historically um, made it very clear that we take the vote that we participate in inter district school choice. So it has to be done one more study first, I believe. It's much right first, according to that. Um, so, do we have a motion? So, second. Okay. Uh, any questions? Another question, but for the people out there who may have a question, we don't have a choice to not let our students go. Right. We just, do not. Just so right. just, I remember, <laughs> you know, I've gone through this many times over the years, but just so people out there, if they're wondering, we would love to have every Gloucester child come to Gloucester schools. But everything we talked about today is to make that an easier task. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Exactly. That is our, that is one of our primary goals. But there are, as you said, this is to allow um, us and to accept students. Right. And we would love to have other students come, particularly when we have our vocational programs that other schools don't have. We have fabulous programs all throughout the school. So. Yeah, robotics and engineering in the high school, great program, absolutely. Yeah. And we have a roll call vote. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Burden. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. And Mr. Minio. Yes. Okay, motion carries unanimously. 
Um, the last item of business is approval of the nurses contract effective September 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2024. I'll turn it over to Sam Watson. Mm -hmm. um, so in your packet, you'll see the tentative agreement um, between Massachusetts Nurses Association and the Gloucester School Committee. We met on March 14th. Um, and per our executive session and the guidance from the full committee, we, um, we stood firm on our final offer and we were successful in coming to an agreement. Um, so without, um, does anybody have any questions on what's in the packet? Or are you comfortable with moving forward with a motion tonight? Good question. Maybe, um, Maybe it's a simple answer, but it is. But um, with these, um, what were those days? The, the, the personal days, I think there were, the two that were added on, right? If they don't use them, they get paid from them anyway. So essentially, they're getting paid twice. Or like, say, like, you know, they, they never took a day off, but they work, they got paid, plus they get paid. Am I understanding that? Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, they never took the day off. Sure. So, you know what I mean? so we, it, it's we in other units we've given extra personal days right and there was a request so i guess i want to preface this first because if it's something that you are not going to agree with we need to schedule an executive session we kind of yeah. did this this approval a little bit yeah, different yeah, yeah. I'm just so are you just curious time. about yeah. how it work as opposed to opposing it because that yeah. need to be clear just on that. clarification okay. like, yeah. like is that what's happening yeah so um, a lot of times we get, if you don't mind, I don't want to step on your jokes. Um, a lot of times we get proposals, and in this situation, we did, they wanted to, they wanted more personal days every year. Most groups have three. We have one group that works year round that gets four. Yeah, so one. when they ask for more, we have to consider that, right? So in this situation, knowing that nurses worked extremely hard, nurses, we did not have substitutes. So if they wanted to take a day off, most of them came to work anyway because there wasn't a substitute to fill in from them, right? So they were exhausted. They are working to capacity. They probably didn't take a lot of their time off that they're entitled to or some of the time they're entitled to because they just couldn't because there's no one to fill in and they're very responsible and obligated to their responsibilities. So they just didn't. So recognizing all that, we gave them the ability for this year only, knowing they didn't get to take the time, they did ask for more personal time, that this was kind of a way of recognizing their hard work, that they were dedicated to their responsibilities. So two of the days off, yes, they're, they're gonna get financing for that if yeah, it's okay. because they can't take the time off. Right, more or less the kind of backdoor bonus. Huh? Yeah. I don't know that I would use that word backdoor. I mean, uh, but exactly. yeah. Yeah, all right. I mean, the, if that, that's what we decided to give them this year. I mean, each group we give, we do something a little bit different in each group because we can't treat everybody the same way because their job responsibilities are different, their working conditions are different, their responsibilities are different. So in this, um, in this negotiation rounds, we knew that this year was a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers were very successful in getting some um, some ask from their group, and this was something that was important to them to get more personal time. Yeah. So that's what we decided. Okay. Yeah, to yeah. Do. Just, yeah. Yeah. Right. You're also welcome to take time off too. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is Provided really what they want to do. Yeah, and we do have we, do we have it now. We do we have one yeah. right now yeah, this year. Awesome. Yes. We don't know that we'll have it next year, right. but we know we have it right now. So that's why one of the reasons why I agreed to this year only. Yeah. Trust me, they want to be on a beach somewhere or a day off as opposed to a school and short. Yeah. With <laughs> so well deserved. But that's not for next year. It's just this year only. And I think Sam's going to read into the. Yeah, when we, the, after the motion, I'll read the whole. Um, so do we have a motion to accept? Second. Um, uh, to approve. To, yeah. To approve the nurse's Sorry. That's okay. Nope, done it. Or should I? I'm just going to say the dates, though. For to be in effect September 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2024. Okay. 
His prints. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. I thought you were going to read the, yeah, the, read the terms. The terms. Of oh, I'm sorry. For discussion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. I take that back. Matching them on. You what? <laughs> oh, I said yes already. So I said yes. Um, all right. So the compensation proposal. So FY22, there'll be an increase of 2.25%. And um, we're going to add step 13 at 2% for both EA and MA levels. FY23, an increase of 2.25%. We'll drop the first step for both BA and MA levels and add 1% to step 13 for both. BA and MA, and then FY24 is a 2.5% increase. Drop the first step for both BA and MA, and add 1% to step 13, resulting in a top step increase of 4% for step 12 for both BA and MA. Um, so the personal days for FY22, nurses would be entitled to two additional personal days. If a nurse could not take those personal days for any reason or because the substitute wasn't available, then those two days would be paid as um, compensatory time at that nurse's daily rate. A nurse who serves 90 days or more in any step shall move to the next step on 9 1 of each subsequent year. Upon initial employment in the Gloucester Public Schools, nurses will full credit for every one year of relevant experience in nursing and or school nurse work up to a maximum of step five. Through fiscal year 2023, if there are COVID regulate, related regulations or mandates uh, instituted by the State Department of Public Health or DESE that nurses are required to perform, then $5 per hour increase for hours 36 to 40 would be implemented. Um, and then substitute pay increases to $25 per hour. Then the contract shall be in effect September 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2024. Questions? So just to add to the discussion, um, for Keith and Bill, I'm sure you probably may recognize this already. So we we have been pretty consistent over the past couple of years trying to keep nurses in parity with the GTA. So this salary increase is equivalent to what would be the GTA. Um, Robert, I mean, taking off the top the first step and adding steps to the bottom is consistent with what we did with the GTA. So um Helps us in the hiring process, bringing in this is at a higher pay rate, yeah, and retention. So, I just wanted those who didn't realize that, or the public, if they're listening, that it's pretty equivalent to what the GTA requested and approved. Any more discussion? Okay, Maria, may we vote? Ms. Prince? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor Virgo? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yes. Chip Russell Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. And Mr. Minio? Yes. Um, that concludes the action. Um, the next item is the Gloucester Veterans Memorial School update. So a couple of things on that. Um, Huge. <laughs> that steel is, steel is, so, so they're done with the steel on, on building A, which is on the academic wing, and they are working very quickly on uh, building B, which is the nursery offices, cafeteria, um, gymnasium, and a few other, you know, art, art music, thank you, um, spaces. Um, we are gearing up for the topping off ceremony, which is April 13th. Um, hoping that, if no, is that wrong? April, April, April 8th, Friday, April 8th, sorry. Oh. Friday, April 8th. Um, thank you. Uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, Kathy and the mayor will make us some brief remarks there. And, you know, um, uh, and we started that process because we brought together the um, veterans and the staff on Tuesday afternoon to come over to the building site and see it instead of getting a tour of the outside and looking at the steel. And they signed, the first to sign the beam. Both staff, um, and I, I did as well, signed the beam. Uh, it's, a, it's a white beam, it'll be the last beam that's put into place. Um, and then uh, today, or no, maybe tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow, the student nominations committee uh, for the naming is gonna go over there. They're gonna film a video about the nomination process or the naming process, and they're gonna sign the beam as well. And then uh, on April 8th, the second graders will come over, um, sign the beam, there'll be some music played as the beam is going into place, that sort of thing. Um, and we'll have some you know, brief remarks. Um, uh, folks will be standing around, so the remarks need to be brief. Um, I haven't said that already. Uh, in terms of um, a couple of just developments, um, uh, 
we uh, we're working and just just trying to be good neighbors as we as we continue to try to be and I think are being. Um, we had one snap through. We've had at this point more than fifty deliveries, probably sixty deliveries of large trucks delivering materials. You know everything from dirt to to steel to other to, to machinery. Um, a few weeks ago, um, got word of what was truck that had trouble making a right hand turn on Webster. And then got sort of backed up in traffic or caught in traffic and, and then tra held up traffic some. And so because of that, um, talking to one of the neighbors and also uh, please DPW, our project team, uh, city councilor, um, made just a couple of changes on that. One was uh, have now have school construction zone signs, you know, uh, um, along Eastern Avenue, warning people of that there you know, are large trucks around. Um, and then also are making sure that whenever there's delivery, um, folks from the site are aware of it and then looking out in case uh, the rare truck does have a, have a you know, trouble with the, with the backing up. What's good about this site, unlike, unlike a lot of deliveries in the city, is that they immediately pull um, off the road onto the construction site. They're not unloading anything on Webster Street. So that, that's just a, 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 it's one of the values of that large site. So we made some adjustments in order to just, you know, as we get better as we do things here. Um, but again, they've been very, very you know, hardly any snafus at all in terms of deliveries and that's going well. Um, we will be um, telling, make sure all the neighbors know about as we move into April, there will be some late, later nights as they do the concrete pours on each level of each building. So for example, the first concrete pour they'll do is on the second level of the building A, and that allows them to then protect below that from the elements, um, hopefully just rain at that point, um, in order to start doing the um, some of the work in the in the foundation basement area plumbing and the like, but when they do those concrete pours of a whole entire level of the building, uh, it's a long day. Starts early, um, it goes late. Um, there'll be some additional lighting there. Um, the sound, the noise that happens later, and and that means it's like eight o'clock sort of thing. It's not like you know um, much other than that. Um, uh, is just uh, the smoothing machine, smoothing the concrete out, you know, the wet concrete out. Um, but we're going to be communicating to, um, that's going to probably be the first week of April at this point. We'll be communicating to leafleting the neighbors, uh, putting on our website, emailing those folks who signed for email notices, make sure city councilors know it, make sure, of course, you, you, you all know it, um, just so folks, you know, no surprises, if people are aware on the, on the you know, smaller nights where it's extended, extended work day, essentially. So, um, all just trying to keep things on schedule and also make sure that we're uh, informing the neighborhood as best we can about any changes in the process. So hopefully you can join us on April 8th. What time? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's 9 30, but we'll, we'll confirm. Thanks. Yeah. This will be less um, formal. It's less formal, yeah. Less formal. Yeah. But it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So. And you know, who doesn't like big cranes? <laughs> All right. Uh, any other business? No. Okay. Motion to adjourn from anybody? So moved. So moved. Okay. 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 Roll call vote, Maria, please. Ms. Prince. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Weeson. Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Mr. Melman. Yes. Mr. Melman. Yes. And Mr. Minion. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for who has plugged in and joined us this evening. And thank you.